Hi, I'm Dan Olson. Uh, welcome to my YouTube channel. This is where I post videos of some of my talks, but mainly the talks from my Lean Product Meetup. It just so happens that tonight's meetup, I was the speaker, and I shared some advice from the Lean Product Playbook, specifically on how to iterate your product to improve it with rapid prototyping and user testing. Uh, I talked about the Lean Product process for my book. In a lot of my other talks you find online, I focus a lot on on customer needs and on your value proposition. In this talk, I went heavier on the later steps in the process. How to think about your MVP, how to use UX design to create a prototype, and I went deep on how to actually test your prototype with users and how to learn from that and iterate from the user testing. Um, so there's a lot of new content in that section, specifically on when you're running user tests and say you test, do, you know, do five to eight one-on-one -on -one user interviews in a wave, how do you make sense of the data that you get from those interviews? So I have some very clear slides on that. There's also a lot of great Q&A from the audience that I think you'll find valuable. So if you enjoy the video, please like it and subscribe to our channel and also um, subscribe to notifications so that when I post another new video from next month's speaker, which is actually going to be Mark Tarpenning, the co-founder of Tesla, then you'll get notified when that video is live. Thanks a lot. So yeah, I'm going to talk about how to iterate and improve your product with rapid user testing. This is kind of a general philosophy of mine. If you've seen any of my other talks, it's implicit. In this talk, I'm going to focus more on that. I'm going to share some basic principles that are common, but then I want to go deeper. And I have a lot of new co some new content and slides in this particular area. Um, so I want to share those with you guys. Um, real quick so you understand my background, I started out with a technical background. I was very lucky. My parents, um, in hindsight, I'm so glad they got me a computer when I was nine. I a, and so I learned to code then, so I was very comfortable. And then I was an electrical engineering major, and then I did submarine design. And then I was like, you know, I want to I wanna go get an MBA, and I want to get more on the business side of things. So that's what brought me out to Silicon Valley, going to Stanford. And that's where I discovered it, this career called product management. And I said, that sounds great. That sounds like exactly what I want to do. I, I have been an engineer. I want to get more on the business side of things and figure out what the product should be, but not actually be the one building it. So uh, since I had never done it, I asked everybody at the time, where's the best place to learn product management? And everybody unanimously said Intuit was the best place to learn. So luckily, I interviewed at Intuit and I got a job at Intuit. Um, and I worked here for five years. So that's where I started my product management career. After Intuit, I uh, went, was a product leader at several startups. And then like a lot of people, I had a desire to do my own startup. So I was CEO and co-founder of a startup that launched TechCrunch as a personalized new startup called Your Version. And what I've been doing for a long time now is uh, basically being a product management consultant and trainer. Um, these are some of my clients there. Uh, for a long time, I would be like the interim VP of product for an early stage startup. So for Box, I worked there in 2007. I was like their interim VP of product. Um, One Medical, same kind of thing. Medallia, they just IPO'd on Friday. So I added to my unicorn list, which is great. Um, but there I worked with them for two years to basically hire, grow, and train and coach their product team. So that was a lot of fun. So, these days I do a lot more training workshops, like private workshops like I do with Sam's Club, um, public workshops, things like that. And then I'm the founder of here. And that's my Twitter handle. And then all my slides and videos are on my website, dan -olson All right, well, since we have so many product, I noticed how many product managers' hands went up. It's a rare opportunity to share one of the most closely guarded product management secrets that's out there, which is a product manager's model. Now, some of you may know this, some of you may not. It's a bit like Spider-Man's motto. Does anyone know? We're in Silicon Valley. Someone should know Spider-Man's motto. Who knows it? Great power comes great responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. That's right. The product manager's motto is similar. It's just a little different. And it's with great responsibility comes no power. <laughs> and we're laughing on the outside, but we're crying a little bit on the inside, aren't we? Wouldn't it be great if we just had a little bit more power, right? So anyway, we're responsible for a lot of things, right? We're responsible for a lot of things. And one of the things we're responsible for is achieving product market fit, especially in the context of a new product. We've got to achieve product market fit. And so, um, you know, product market fit it was actually coined by Mark Andreessen back in 2007. Uh, the gentleman that invented the Netscape browser and is now a famous venture capitalist. Um, and it, but it didn't really take off until the lean startup movement. And so, uh, and the interesting thing is when you have a movement like lean startup, um, there are a lot of buzzwords that come out, like product market fit or MVP, right? MVP is always fun to talk about because people always just agree on, just totally agree on what it means, right? They totally see eye to eye on what it means, right? Not at all. That's like the poster child where everyone's arguing about, this isn't an MVP, that's an MVP. Um, this one is a little different. People talk about product market fit actually too simplistically. They just say, oh, 
box, yeah, box succeeded because they had product market fit. Sadly, startup A, startup A failed because they did not have product market fit. So people talk about it like this, you know, true or false condition. And there wasn't a lot of good guidance on how to achieve it. And I was fortunate that having worked on so many different products, especially as a consultant with so many different teams, I started to see a pattern of like, what are the conditions that need to be there in order to achieve product market fit? Obviously, the details of the particular product are different, but there's a certain set of things you need to get right. And so that's why I wrote the Lean Product Playbook to kind of document that process and those frameworks. Um, and that's why I'm going to start out by walking you through some of the key frameworks, and then we'll do a deeper dive on the prototyping and user testing part of it, right? So the key framework is the product market fit pyramid. And it has five layers. And the way you can think about it is the five main hypotheses you need to get right enough in order to achieve product market fit. That's the idea. So the bottom two layers are the market, right? So at the very bottom, we have target customer. That's whose uh, life we're trying to make easier, whose pain points we're trying to address, who we're trying to create value for. Um, and like a real pyramid, the idea is each layer is meant to build on the layers beneath it. So the next layer up is for that target customer, what are their, what are their needs? Right? We don't want to focus too soon on features. I'm going to talk about this more in a second. Solutions, we want to focus on what are their needs and problems. And more specifically, you'll see the word underserved there. We want to focus on the needs that are not well served today. If someone's perfectly happy with how a need's getting met today, that's probably not the one we want to target. And so I have a whole framework for that. But taken together, these two layers are the market, basically. And a market, if you look in an economics, or in a marketing textbook, it'll say a market is a set of people that share a set of common needs. That's a market, basically. And you don't actually control the market. You can't control what those people do. You can target them and try to build things for them. What you control are the product layers. And the way I like to represent those is with these three hypotheses. The value proposition, which in an ideal world builds directly on the underserved needs when you have product market fit. Uh, when you don't, there can be a gap. And the value proposition is, okay, what are we actually going to tell customers? What are we going to promise to them that our product does for them? And how are we going to do so? How are we going to meet those needs in a way that's better than the other products that are out there? That's where product strategy lives. Uh, and then there's feature set. The next thing up is feature set. That's the functionality that actually conveys the benefits in the value proposition to the customers. And that's where the concept of the MVP comes in, which we're going to talk about tonight, so that we don't overbuild, we don't overcommit resources before we figure out whether or not we're heading in the right direction. And then finally, user experience, UX. That's what the user actually interacts with to use the functionality to get the benefits in your value proposition. So again, these are these five things. You can think about it like a, like a five term equation or multiplication or like a logic thing, a five and term and. You need to get each of these enough right. They don't have to be perfect, but if any one of these is off, it's going to get in the way of achieving product market fit. And once you, once you realize this model, you realize product market fit is just we're making assumptions and executing in the product layers. How well do those decisions and products that we're designing and defining, how well do they resonate with the market? That's basically what product market fit is. And again, the specifics are obviously going to be different for your product. So once I had the framework, I realized you know, I, can, I can create a process to guide people through step by step forming these hypotheses and improve testing and improving these hypotheses. And that's what I call the lean product process. And so the lean product process is just six steps. You step one is you start at the bottom of the pyramid and you get clear on who's, who do I think my car customer is. Then you move up to what do I think the underserved needs are. Then you come up with what your value prop is, which is again, which benefits are we going to deliver for customers and how are we going to do so in a way that's better than the competition. Then your feature set, your UX design. And then there's just one last step because now when we get to this point, if we have a UX design, whether it's a live product or a prototype, it kind of represents all the assumptions we've made going up the pyramid. And so the last step is to take that UX and then close the loop and test it with customers and see where we're at with product market fit. That's the lean product process. And um, you know, when I have an all day workshop or something, I can, I'm able to go through all six steps. Today I'm going to be focusing a lot on step six, which is testing with customers, as well as four and five, you know, figuring out what your MVP should be, and kind of some, a little bit on prototyping as well, because that's the idea. So in other talks, I focus more on one, two, three. Three, I had to skip three today, unfortunately. I love three. Three is a great topic. And two is a great topic. So two is my importance and satisfaction framework. That's how you figure out how underserved or overserved the need is. And value prop is the Kano model and, and kind of figuring out what your special sauce is. But we're going to skip those and focus on four, five, and six today. Okay? Um, and you may have heard of build, measure, learn. Um, I have my own version of the iteration loop because this is an iterative process that starts with hypothesize instead of build. Because I prefer, you know, the whole point of today's talk is you can actually get really far and test more quickly and save resources by using prototypes to test than actually building it. You know, obviously you can build it and test what you built, 
but then when you need to change it, it's a lot harder and takes more effort and time than a prototype. And I'll close out with the case study today where I show how quickly we were able to iterate. But it starts with hypothesize, you form your hypotheses, you design a way to test your hypotheses, you test them, you learn from the test, and then you revise your hypothesis and you go on to the next iteration that way. So that's the idea. So step one, you know, and it's important actually to cover target customer because we're going to close the loop. In step six, we close the loop and we want to make sure we know who we're going to do research with. Um, and by the way, you can apply this process for a new V1 product. Obviously, you can apply it. You can also apply it at the feature level. Say you're launching a new large or medium-sized feature, even a small feature, you can apply this concept. Or a V2, or even like, a, frankly, a product where you haven't applied any of these concepts, you can apply it there as well. Uh, but I want to show why the chart customer is so important. And, and I'll also acknowledge, say you were working on a V1, a brand new product, you may not have a good idea who your target customer is yet. That's perfectly fine. Again, this is an iterative process. So it's perfectly fine to start out with a very preliminary assumption or hypothesis and then iterate it as you go. But I want to show why it's so important to take the customer into account. And I remember actually um, a little while back, I was asked to judge a competition at the Stanford Design School. And I walked up to the first team and they had their poster there, you know, talking about their project they'd worked on. And I was like, first question I asked was, who's your target customer? And what they said to me was millennials. And I said, okay, cool, that sounds good. That was my first reaction. But then I thought about it, I'm like, wait a minute, how many millennials are there in the world? There's like millions of millennials in the world. So this happens a lot in product management and design and product development where you get an answer from someone and it sounds specific, but when you really scratch your head and think about it, it's really not that actionable and specific. So that's what millennials was, right? And it turns out their product was like a blue apron kind of a product where it's like, hey, if you're, you want to cook at home, but you're too busy, so they kind of give you the prepared food and you, know, you still have to cook it, obviously, and mix it up and all that jazz, but they give you it all ready to go. So it would have been better, and this is what I, I, the analogy I like to use is peeling the onion. When they said millennials, that's like the outer layer of the onion. The trick is how can we get the insight to peel the onion? If they had said instead it's for millennials who want to cook at home but are too busy, that would have been peeling the onion like two more layers and would be a much more specific, useful description of your target customer. So that's the trick is don't fall for those things that sound specific but aren't. So let me show you why it's really important to think about target customer and think about the needs and preferences through their lens. I want to take it again, this is kind of like a high level onion need, transportation within 100 miles of my home. A lot of people have this need. And if we just stayed at that level, that would be like saying millennials and being at the higher level, the outer layer of the onion. But the second we look through the lens of specific personas, you'll see that the details are quite different, they, even though they both have that need. Let's take two different target customers. On the one hand, a soccer parent. So this is a soccer mom or dad who drives their kids around to soccer games and practices, right? Uh, and on the other hand, a speed demon, right? So they both have that need to get around, right? They obviously both have that need to get around. But if I went out and did like 20 one-on-one -on -one customer discovery interviews with soccer parents, and I said, hey, can you tell me what's important when it comes to transportation, what's important to you? They, I might hear things like, well, you know, I'm carrying my children, their friends, and all their athletic gear, so the car's gotta be big enough to hold all this stuff. Like a little Mini Cooper is not gonna do it for me, right? Um, I'm driving my children around to me, so how safe the car is, is on my mind as well. And I'm doing a lot of driving, a lot of miles, so it'd be great if I could save some money on gas. Those might be some things that they, we would hear from them. If I interviewed 20 speed demons, we probably wouldn't hear any of those things. We'd probably hear things like, well, what's important to me is how fast does the car go? How cool does the car look? And how cool do I look when I'm driving down Santana Row in my car, right? Um, and so you end up with very different products as a result. They both meet the high level need, right? They both give you the transportation, the basic need, but each does so in a way that's been optimized for their target market. And I like to bring up cars because just think about all the different shapes and sizes of cars you see out there. You got trucks, minivans, right? Coopers, you got all kinds of cars out there. The car market, they've done a really good job of segmenting the market and making sure the product is optimized for product market fit for their distinct segments. So what's the tool if, you're, if, you, if you buy into my thing of, well, we really got to peel the onion. The, the trick to achieving product market fit is peeling the onion on your customer and what their needs are to really get that deep insight. You're going to start out the arrow layer, that's fine. The tool that we use to peel the onion is segmentation. And there are four main ways to segment um, customers or your market. The first and most obvious and the one that most people jump to right away is demographic. Oh, our, our, our products for women in their 30s. Our products for retirees, our products for college kids, right? That, those would be demographic descriptions, right? And the, the, the pro of it is it's easy to get your head around and understand. The con is it probably is the least related to the underlying causality of the situation of what's going on, right? 
Um, and by the way, there's firmer graphics for business, like what industry, sector, you know, number of employees, retail, geography, revenue, geography, all that. So um, yeah, but you know, that's usually not the core. There'll be, it's kind of like you'll see the distribution, the statistics will play out on the demographics, but that's not really what's driving it. Uh, psychographic is the second segmentation. This is what do you believe, what's important to you, what are your opinions. So for example, like being environmentally conscious would be a psychographic attribute. It would have nothing to do with your age. We could find an 18-year-old that cared a lot about being environmentally conscious. We could find an 80-year-old that cared a lot about being environmentally conscious, right? So that's psychographic. It's what people are saying. And behavioral is the third one, is what people are doing. What are they actually doing? Uh, and if, you're in a, if you have an existing product, an important behavioral segmentation is often your high-frequency power users versus your lightweight kind of novice users. That's a behavioral segmentation, for example. And the interesting thing is a lot of times what people say and what they do don't always add up, right? So if I say I was doing a customer interview with Harrison here, and I said, hey, Harrison, we're doing a new product. How important is, is it to be, how important is the environment to you? He's like, Dan, it's 10 out of 10 important, super important. I'm like, cool, thanks. And then he leaves the interview and he takes a Starbucks cup and he throws it on the floor. All right, that would be behavioral versus attitudinal. That's the difference. And then finally, there's needs base, where you're actually able to articulate the different needs that different segments of your market have. And I remember I was at an event and the head of product of a new company, he first went in and he said, hey, okay, let me see the segmentation of our market. And his team came back with demographics and there were no obvious patterns or clusters. And then they went back and redid it with needs base and all of a sudden the clusters were much more clear. So um, the way you capture, the tool you use to capture your assumptions about this. So at the end of the day, all you want to do is say, oh, the other question I get is, oh, okay, which one of these is the best? Which one should I use? It's not an, it's not an either or. Slice and dice with all these if you can. Triangulate and really get in on what your customers are. It's perfectly fine. I'll show you an example in a sec. Um, the, the artifact that we use to capture these assumptions is a persona. So personas are typically used later in the process in UX design, but I think they can be used early on right now. And it can be a lightweight persona called like a proto persona. It could just be a list of bullet points of what you think those key attributes, key demographic, psychographic, behavioral, and needs-based attributes are. And then we'll iterate from there. This is a robust persona. This is from the book. This is not what I would expect you to start out with, just to be clear. Like this is like after a lot of research and stuff, and it probably has too much, it's more probably TMI than you really need. Uh, what matters the most, a couple things that I think are most important. One, the busy mom is a nice, having a nice short handle that people can use internally. You know, that's, that's very handy so that if you're in a meeting and someone, you're having a debate, they can say, well, what would the busy mom want? What would they prefer, right? You could do, you could do that. The other thing is probably the most important is this, the quote. The, the quote where they're in their own words, in their own voice, are explaining what their pain point is. That's really important so that everyone on the team can empathize with them and understand what their need is. And then I think probably third most important is the picture, just because it's really our brains are wired to remember people's faces. And so, you know, label, face, quote, those three would be great just to kind of, uh, that's like the MVP, I guess, persona where you want to get to, hopefully. And then I mentioned proto personas. So this is, you know, this is like a robust one. I literally just did this with a client um, a couple of months ago, and they had three segments. So this is what I call a proto persona. The key is just to I don't get tripped up. Who's had a bad experience with personas, by the way? Has anyone had a bad experience with personas? Yeah. So I say this in the book. Don't blame the tool just because you've had a bad experience. I've seen bad, you know, how are they bad? One is when they're not based on data or evidence. Someone's just making it up, right? And I've seen some some creative persona. I think they were frustrated novels. It's like, yeah, this persona likes to take long walks on the beach and they're a Capricorn. And you know, it's like, that doesn't, what does that do? How do I make a product decision based on that? Right? They get, they get a little, they get a little uh, novel writing going on. So we want to keep it to the bare bones. It really is about what are the salient attributes, salient demographic, psychographic, uh, behavioral and needs based attributes. So here I drew this, you can tell, this is my hand sketch using a rocket book actually where I, they told me we have weekend warriors, busy daydreamers, and seasoned free, time, free timers. And we worked and worked and worked and worked and worked, and I realized, you know what, there's really just three salient dimensions that really matter. There's a bunch of other crud and noise in the personas that we had. I said, I think what's most important is we're talking about age, how much free time do they have, and what's their disposable income. And we just said, you know, age, obviously you can do 18 to 65. On the other ones, we just do low, medium, high. And you can see where each one has the bulge in the curve, right? Because that's the other thing about personas. People sometimes get tripped up. They're not point, they're not perfect point estimates, right? It's not like, oh, our persona is 19 and has five hours a week free and a disposable income of 66K. Like, that's not it. It's distributions, right? So I did it this way. So who, who can help me out here? What, what kind of 
attribute, segmentation attribute is age. Demographic, that's right. What kind of, um, what kind of ad, uh, segmentation attribute is free time? It, it seems like it's behavioral, yeah, that's right, that's right. It may also be psychographic, how do they feel, do they feel like they have free time or not, but I would think free behavioral would be the first answer. And then finally, disposable income? Demographic. demographic, right. So we got two demographics and a behavioral is kind of what we started out with now, right? All right, cool. So that's, that's understanding your target customer. There's obviously more in the book on that, but I just want to cover this because remember this slide, because in step six, when we have our nice shiny prototype and it's go to do user testing, who are we going to want to talk to? These people. How are we going to make sure they're those people? We're going to ask them screener survey questions on age, free time, and disposable income to match up here to make sure they're the right people that we talk to. All right, cool. Step two uh, is identify underserved customer needs. I just want to touch on this briefly because what we're basically forming, the key hypotheses we're forming are about what are the customer needs. Before we get to the prototype design, we want to get clear on what their needs are basically. And a really important concept here that I've covered in the, that I cover in the book is the idea of problem space versus solution space. And I want to explain this real quick. Problem space is basically a customer problem, need, or benefit that the product should provide to the customer. Right? If you're probably all familiar with the Agile user story template as a blank, I want a blank so I can blank. That last part, so I can blank, that's really kind of like what is the problem? How is it going to create value for the user? In contrast, solution space is a specific implementation that's going to address that need or requirement. Right? Um, so if I said, hey, you know, I think I can, uh, I want to make it easier for people to share photos with their friends, that statement, make it easier to share photos with your friends, is in the problem space. If the next thing I said is, yeah, I was working with my friend Rohan on a cool app and uh, we, we just launched it yesterday, that app would be in the solution space. Or if I said, hey, my friend Will Yon's an awesome designer, I haven't had a chance to code it yet, but he gave me this awesome set of mockups, that set of mockups would be in the solution space. That's a difference, right? So the, the problem you're trying to solve, the, how, how you're trying to fundamentally create value for the customers in the problem space, designs and code and products are in the solution space. And the key thing here is most teams move too quickly to solution space. Some go directly there, don't even think about problems, but very few spend enough time in the problem space. And I understand why we live in the solution space, right? Problem space is not a natural thing for us to kind of be a master of. Um, but as I like to say, you know, Designer, you know, developers have to code and develop. They launch stuff in the problem space. They launch stuff in the solution space, right? Their code and product lives in the solution space. It's like, you know, it produces JavaScript and HTML. Designers, what do they produce? They produce mockups and wireframes. They're in the solution space too. So they're in the solution space. And designers actually play a really important role. Once you're clear on the problem space, level one design is great. Hey, we came up with a concept and a mockup. Let's go with this one. That's okay, but it would be much better if your design team could help you explore the different solution space options. That's one of the main value adds that, it, aside from coming up with a good design, coming up with multiple directions to explore them. So if those guys are working in the solution space, who's thinking about the problem space, right? That's where product managers should. I do think UX designers should as well if they want to. That's great. UX researchers should, right? But at the end of the day, uh, product managers should definitely, that's one of the main things you should bring to your team. So yes, you want to you know, review mock-ups and review the, the, the alpha builds and things like that. Of course you want to do that, but your real main unique value add, I think, is more upfront with the customer understanding and figuring out what the problems are that we're going to solve. The example I like to use to illustrate this is um, when NASA was sending astronauts into space, they knew that the pens that we use, ballpoint pens, that rely on gravity wouldn't work because there's no gravity in space. I just want to say this up front, if you Google this, you'll end up on some urban legend thing. It says, oh, NASA never did this. It's true, NASA didn't do it, and I have all the links, reference links in the book. It wasn't NASA, but one of NASA's contractors, the head of that company said, you know what? I think we can invent a pen that writes in space. And NASA didn't ask him to do it, but he went off and spent a million dollars of his own money, and he invented a space pen. So I have a space pen here. Uh, I haven't had a chance to verify it in space. I know we're pretty close to NASA here. Anyone work at NASA can help me out, go verify that. That would be great. I'd love to. I'm a space geek, so that would be cool. Now, the Russians also had astronauts that they were sending into space, but instead of doing space pens, they gave them uh, pencils. <laughs> and you can actually get a Russian space pen. It's just a, a joke. It's a red pencil in a box poking fun at the million dollar space gun going, ha ha. Look at that, you know, you don't have to do that. So why do I tell this story? I tell this story because one, obviously if both of these um, products are equally good solutions, are good, equally good solutions to the problem, 
then the one that doesn't cost a million dollars and take all that time and effort to develop is obviously better, higher ROI. That's the obvious reason. But the other reason I, I mention it is it's so easy even when you're trying to focus on the problem space for, to, to let some solution thinking creep in and pollute your problem space. I call it solution pollution basically, right? So when the head of the company said, you know what? I think I can invent a pen that writes in space and that was ostensibly his requirement or problem space. He had some solution pollution in his, in his requirement. What was his pollution that he had? Yeah, he put the, and not surprisingly, he worked for the Fisher Pen Company. Like all they did was pens, like pens, pens, pens. So he had tunnel vision. Makes sense why, but he like baked. If that was his requirement, he'd done that. And that happens all the time. That happens all the time. It would be it, it'd be better if he just been vague and said a way to write in space. That would have been better than actually listing any solution, embedding any solution. And that's the key hack. And how does this happen on our on our on our feature team, on our product, and our Scrum teams? How does this happen? You go to Jira, you go to Trello, and it says, add a drop down that does blank, blank, blank. Right? Add a menu that does da, da, da. You know, add an API call, add this database column, add this method, add this screen, add this hamburger menu. Are those solutions or problems? Those are all solutions. So when you see a Jira, it's funny, because everybody knows the Agile user story template. It has a blank, I want a blank, so I can blank. But when it comes time to write a Jira ticket, everyone has amnesia all of a sudden. I don't know, what, what? No, no, just add a drop down. No, just add a drop down. Just add Here's what it should look like, just build it, right? So when you see that, the key way to get people to make sure you're focused on the problem is to ask why. So if, you know, when somebody put add a drop down, you can say why. Well, so we need to give the customer a way to pick the shipping address. Okay, great. That's the problem. And maybe a drop down is the best solution. Maybe it's not. If you don't list the problem in the story, we'll never know and no one will ever come up with a better idea perhaps or evaluate it. So the other empowering factor when you list the problems is we have smart people on the team. Maybe they can come up with an even better idea than the solution that you originally came up with. So it's very empowering to list and make sure you're focused on the problems. Um, now, I'll say there are other requirements. I focus on the requirement to write. Obviously, you don't want things to burn in space and you know, lead can break off and get into things. So I, you know, I kind of contrived the example a little bit to focus on writing, just mainly to get the point of solution pollution across to people because you see it happen all the time. Let's talk about a, a near and dear solution, literally. Uh, I worked it into it uh, on Quicken, but one of our other big products is TurboTax. Anybody use TurboTax in the last, say, nine months? Back in April, I know we're trying to forget it, but <laughs> we had to file our tax. I actually did an extension, so I still have to pay the piper on. I have to do that in October. Um, it's a software product, so it's in the solution space, right? It competes with another software product, Tax Cut, in the solution space. And what you want to do, ideally, is start in the problem space and then map. But we can also reverse engineer and try to map back. Okay, what is the problem that these products solve? So for those of you that raised your hand and said you use TurboTax, what's the problem? How does it create value for you? Why do you use it? Why do you like it? Makes doing taxes easier. Makes doing taxes easier. Accuracy. Accuracy. File online. File online, yeah, in your pajamas, yeah. <laughs> Saves, the trip Saves. To the Saves the trip to the accountant. Saves time. Save money. Save money. <laughs> Woo. It remembers last year. It remembers last year's information. Yeah. Anybody else? It pulls information. Yeah. Pulls information. Yeah, integrates with like all the financial institutions. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Community. Community. Okay. It's a good show, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Yeah, so we, yeah, it was great. You all gave me great, and none of those were really features kind of. It was like a lot of, like, importing data from last year is a bit of a feature. So I could do the why Jedi mind trick on you and say, why is importing data from last year valuable to you? Saves time. So Saves time. So you don't have to type it in again, right? Forgetting. Forget, so you don't forget, right? Cool, yeah. So for some people, it might be save time. For other people, that, and that's it. Great, cool, awesome, exactly. So, and again, it's an onion. Right? And you were giving, all were giving me very detailed answers, which is great. If we wanted to say, well, what's the overall onion? It would probably be something like, it helps me prepare my taxes, helps me do my taxes. We definitely want to peel the onion and get down to the layer that you all were talking about there, right? Um, so we want to start, ah, oh shoot, I forgot that. The other person, so actually one person that helped me appreciate the problem space was Scott Cook. He's the founder of Intuit. And when he would have a group of people together like this, what he would do, after the end of his talk, he'd be like, who's the biggest competitor to TurboTax? And all the eager beaver PMs like me would raise their hand and he'd hope, you know, he'd pick you and you'd get the answer right, right, for the founder. And you'd say, he, you know, he'd pick you and you'd be like, oh, it's TurboTax is the biggest competitor. He's like, no, you're wrong, it's pen and paper because more Americans were doing their tax returns with pen and paper, right? That's the other thing is focusing on the problems helps you really understand what are the true substitutes or alternatives because there's always some hacks, manual workarounds. I was actually at a client workshop and everyone's like, wow, oh, this is for internal customers, Dan. 
They have to use it. They have to use it. <laughs> the, they're our employees. They have to use it. And I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be the bad guy, but I was very lucky because someone that used to be one of those former employees was now working at HQ, and she raised her hand, and I said, yes. She's like, well, let me tell you, when your product sucks, here's what we do. We do these workarounds, da 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 So that was great to hear from someone who's in that boat. There's always those workarounds. Have you ever seen the, the photo of like the sidewalk and then like the, the path that cuts across? Like people will find the path of least resistance. They will find it basically, right? So anyway, the, and back to the problem solution space, solutions come and go much more quickly than problems. Those markets are very stable. People have the same needs, you know? Maybe you have a new Bitcoin need now that you didn't have a few years ago, but um, Basically, you know, you have the needs and then these new solution technology waves come and go. The example I talk about in the book is the need, the market and the need to listen to music on the go. A lot of people here probably of you like to listen to music on the go. You know, these days we do it on our phone, but what was the first product that met that need? It was probably an FM transistor radio, a little battery powered FM transistor radio. And then in the 80s, we're all cool with our Walkman, you know, walking around. Those of you that are old enough to remember that. You know, like, what's, the, what's that? What's the tape? Uh, and then we had MP3 players, and we had iPods, and now we have iPhones, right? So you got like five different waves of solutions that came, but the problem of just listening to music on the go didn't change at all. So what we want to do is forget about the solution space, start in the problem space. Identify the onion that you want to focus on. What's that context that we want? What's that market opportunity that we want to really help people with? And then you want to peel the onion, like all those great answers that you gave me, right? You, you, somebody, you know, it, uh, it can check your taxes compared to a pen and paper. It's a computer, so it can check your taxes. Um, somebody said, file my taxes. Instead of having to print it out and go to the mail, mail, uh, the post office and mailing it, you can just push a button and file it. Um, it can ask you questions about what you did this year. Maybe it can find ways to save you money and maximize your deductions. It can perhaps analyze your return and say, hey, this looks a little risky. You may want to look at this. These are just four examples. You all gave me a lot of other great ones. That's what we want to do. That's what I call exploring the problem space. And this is actually a fun time. Once your team identifies the onion, you know, you can say, let's brainstorm all the different things that we do. And this is what I do in my workshops. And it's a lot of fun to see what people come up with. But we're basically suspending, like brainstorming rules apply. We're suspending disbelief and judgment and just trying to come up with one of the craziest ideas of how we could help people with their taxes, right? And you know, if you notice over time, TurboTax does other things. Like they didn't, they didn't do that. It's common now, but they did like refund anticipation loans. Oh, we know from TurboTax you're going to get $2,000 back. Would you like that money now? We'll just charge a little bit and give it to you now. That wasn't in TurboTax, you know, first however many versions of TurboTax, they iterated to get there, right? So that's, there's a lot of creative ways you can do. And again, I just want to show the onion with the layers. You want to peel the onion, basically. And, uh, and it's messy. You know, when you all gave me those TurboTax answers, did anybody give me the same exact answer? Nobody gave me the same exact answer, right? Some people said save time, some people said save money, some people said importing, filing, I got all these different things, right? So that's the thing about the process is messy. And that's why some people kind of uh, shy away from it. It is messy, but you can make sense of it. You'll find that even though it seems messy, certain benefits seem like they're related and like they belong together. So let's, t let's walk through an example. Let's take the atomic benefits, help me prepare my taxes, reduce my audit risk, and check my return. By the way, I forgot to mention, you'll notice that all my benefits, they follow a certain template, right? Not to get too grammatical with you, but what, what, what form of speech do they start with? A verb, that's right, because it's doing something to create value for the user. Right? That's a good way to make sure you're clear on how is it going to create value for the user. And then whose perspective is it written from? The companies, the products? No, it's written from the customers. My taxes, my return, my auto risk. So that's just a good template to follow. But say I, you know, I went out and I talked to people that said that these were their benefits. And I used that why trick, the five whys. Like, why is that valuable? Like, like a toddler. Why, 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 why? Why is that valuable? Why is that valuable? Why is that valuable? Each time I ask you why, I'm getting you to kind of move up one level in thinking, right? So if I, you know, like, like you said, uh, importing the data. So like, hey, why is that valuable? Well, someone else said same time, someone else, she said, well, just not forgetting, right? So you can do that. And when you do that with these three, what I found is you end up at a common, it's like climbing a ladder. We call this a benefit ladder each time you go up. And even though these sound different at the bottom, the three ladders join into one ladder, which is all about empowerment or confidence. And the way that story goes is like, well, you know, before TurboTax, I used to do my taxes by hand. I don't know anything about the tax code. I'm not good with numbers, but I have to do it each year because it's legally required. So I'm really anxious and nervous when I do it. I don't really know what I'm doing. I feel very frustrated. And they probably, you know, I file it, but it's probably wrong. They're probably gonna find me or something. But then a friend told me about TurboTax and I tried it and it just kind of asked me question after question and held my hand. And next thing I knew I was done with my taxes. I felt a lot more confident and empowered in my taxes. 
That would be that, what that benefit ladder would be all about, right? More of an emotional benefit, frankly, than a functional benefit. There, and that's, that's the empowerment benefit ladder. There's a whole distinct benefit ladder that has nothing to do with that. It's orthogonal, which has to do with saving time. A couple of people mentioned saving time here. Um, it can save time preparing taxes. Like if you took a stopwatch and said, okay, doing it by hand took me five days, but doing it by TurboTax took me one day. Or saving you time filing. Instead of having to go and mail it, you can just push a button in, in, in seconds and file it. That's a, that's a second ladder, save time. And there could be a third distinct ladder that has nothing to do with either of those, which is about saving money. Saving money um, by helping you reduce your tax bill or saving money relative to a CPA like somebody else brought up, right? This is what I call a problem space definition. And you know, you don't need more than two levels. You can imagine it rotated 90 degrees where you've got the atomic ones on the bottom and then just you know, laddering up to what the ladder is. But you'll see why I have it this way in a sec. So that's what I think as PMs, that's your job. What's the problem space definition? for the onion, uh, AKA the market opportunity that we're going after. That's what unique value add that you should be bringing to your team and that your team should have to make sure before you go and jump into designing things, we're clear on what problems we're trying to solve. You'll notice I spent, I've spent a lot of time talking about TurboTax without talking about any features. So you can actually spend a lot of time in the problem space if you focus on it. It just so happens that TurboTax has a feature that's mapped one for one with each one of these problems, right? You got the tax interview wizard and so on, right? And so when you're clear about the problems and you get that tight mapping and you have a well-named feature, you get a side benefit, which is just by a user or prospective customer seeing the name of a feature, they can figure out how it's going to create value for them. It's pretty obvious to them how it's going to create value, right? And some things that can happen is you might have some mismatch things. You've got some orphan solution Let's say you have an existing product, not a new product, you got an existing product and you're trying to do this exercise and everyone's scratching their head going, we've got this feature but I'm not sure what it does. Right? Some developer just built it at some point in time or we're not really clear on why. That's like an orphan feature. You might also have an unaddressed problem like, hey, we're hearing this from our customers, we don't have any features that's, that solve that, right? Um, so again, we want to start in the problem space. Now, I don't have time to get into it. I didn't talk about the underserved. This is where we diverge and explore to figure out all the different ways we could do it. I don't have time today to talk about how you how you now winnow this down with importance and satisfaction to figure out how well served each of these are. It's in my other talks and in the book. I also unfortunately don't have time to talk about your, defining your value prop, which is once you figure out what's underserved, you then do a competitive analysis and figure out how are we going to be better? How are we going to save people, we can do a better job saving people money and saving them time on their taxes compared to the other alternatives, right? I'm going to have to skip those today. And we're going to jump straight to four which is assuming we've done those things and we're clear on which benefits, which customer needs are in our uh, value prop, then we're going to go to step four, which is what should our MVP feature set be. And now is where we bridge from problem space to solution space. And the way we do that is the, these boxes are a representation of the benefits, the customer needs that we plan to deliver. They're categorized by must-have performance and the latter, which has to do with the Kano model. We can kind of skip that today, but the idea is basically once you've identified which benefits are in your value prop, this is where again you do divergent brainstorming with your team and brainstorm all the different feature ideas. For this benefit, what are all the different feature ideas we have? For this benefit, what are all the different feature, you know, what are all the different ideas that we have? Right? That's so again, we're not saying we're gonna do these, we're just brainstorming right now. What are all the different ways? If if this was, for example, save people money on their taxes, this would be four different feature ideas of how we could save people money with their taxes. If this was save time, this would be two different feature ideas on how we could save people time on their taxes. That's the idea, right? And I like to call these feature chunks because usually when you first brainstorm a feature, the idea is bigger in scope than it really needs to be. You know, the first time you brainstorm something, you're not thinking about how can I break it down. So if I use chunks to kind of remind people to deliberately go back and think about how could I chunk this up and break it down because there's almost always 80, 20 at play. You don't usually need all 100% of a feature idea to deliver most of the value. So this is the fun, again, fun part where you say, hey, given, you know, let's, let's have a brainstorming on how we can save people time on their taxes. And we do a brainstorming of now it's perfectly fine to talk about feature ideas. Let's do a brainstorming on how all the ways we could save people money on their taxes, right? And then, and then we'll run it through an ROI analysis and all that jazz, which again, I'm going to skip scoping and ROI. And then you get to the tough part of figuring out, okay, what actually needs to be in our V1 MVP? What needs to be in our MVP, right? And so now I've got the, six, the benefits listed here, and then we've got time. And, you know, these were the four benefits that were in our value prop, the two must-haves, this performance, and this delighter. And so at a minimum, we need to have something, we need to have the must-haves, and if we're going to test our special sauce, this is our unique differentiators, we need to have something, right? One mistake I see people make is their MVP only has the must-haves, and you test it, and it's like, customer's like, yeah, so? 
<laughs> that's great that it's HIPAA compliant and I can log in, but like, what's your special sauce, right? Like, what, what do I do? So you gotta have something from your value prop. That's the whole reason of the MVP test, to see if we're right, if we're heading in the right direction. Um, you might have a plan, we kind of call that V1, and then over time, we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna double down on that benefit, we're gonna start addressing that benefit, and then in V2, we're gonna do this. So it's kind of like a roadmap over time of how all the ideas you have, what's your plan of record to attack them. And this is what I would call your MVP candidate because you haven't yet validated with people that they said, yes, it is viable, right? You think, it, your hypothesis is that it's viable, but you haven't yet tested it with people. Now, this is actually one of the trickiest things to do in product management because what happens? You, the product manager says, you know, I think we should go with this. And then some other stakeholder says, are you crazy? You're not gonna have any performance benefit one in the MVP? I don't know, I don't know. I think our customers are gonna be upset if you don't have some performance benefit one there. And then you break down and you say, okay, we'll put that one in there. And then some other stakeholder goes, are you crazy? You're not gonna have any performance benefit two in there? And you say, okay, okay, can you break it right? What happens? You start pulling all these chunks that get pulled into the MVP, right? What happens? It's a slippery slope, right? Once you start, yes, 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 then it's like, you know, and everyone's worried that, you know, especially if you're refactoring something, or redoing like V2 is like, oh, we have to, we have to, that discussion of like, is there anything that we can like defer? Do we have to replicate everything that we had in V1? Usually everyone's answer is yes, of course, right? Because otherwise it would be risky if you didn't. Some customer might complain if you don't have that feature in there. You got to get out of that trap because otherwise your MVP is going to get bloated and your time to market is going to get, it's not going to be an MVP anymore. It's just going to be a P. It's going to be a product, right? So that's the toughest thing. Now what I like to do also, if somebody's pushing really hard, like, oh my gosh, I'm really worried. I really think we got to have this chunk in our MVP. What I like to do is say, okay, sounds like you have a hypothesis that if our MVP doesn't have feature A in it, customers aren't going to like it, aren't going to like our MVP. And they might look at you funny like, yeah. Uh, so I'd say, great, well, how, how might we test that hypothesis? Because if you just bite the bullet and write the check and build the feature, are you testing? You're not really testing anything. You're just like, you're just sucking it up and writing it, right? So what I like to do is I say, how about this? Let's do a prototype without that feature in it. And if you're right, then all the customers are going to yell and scream and then I'll be the first to say you were right and we'll go and put it in. But if I'm right and nobody complains about it, then we can you know, advance our time to market and do that. So that's why wire, especially wireframes, early in the process, you can just like have missing functionality and that's a good way to settle, try to settle that debate without having to bite the bullet. So the other thing that's important and another trick, that, another thing that's important is at each of these stages, the product needs to deliver enough value to the customer, right? You can't have a hobbled MVP. And so there's a pretty famous framework from Spotify, this diagram here, right? It's like, how do you build a car in an MVP process? You know, it's not like this, you build the tire, then the frame, then the body, like that, right? The problem with that is that it's not usable until the end. So yes, you've built it incrementally, but there was no, you know, intermediate waypoint of value to the customer, right? So the counterpoint that they have is, it'd be better to do it this way. You start out with a skateboard, then a scooter, then a bicycle. Now the engineer in me is like, well, yeah, well, if we could somehow get yeah, equipment or code reuse in here, that would be great, right? Unfortunately, these are, you're building new wheels each time. But, so that's why it's not a perfect metaphor, but it's just a reminder that, hey, it's not just about taking some big thing and breaking it into chunks. No, the intermediate deliverables have to have some value, otherwise it's not really, uh, not really breaking it down. All right, cool. So there's two mistakes, uh, let's see, well, MVP, actually MVP, cool, let's do this. So MVP, like I said early on, it's a product market fit, people talk about it kind of simplistically. MVP is the one where people really can get excited and have, anyone here have debates in their company about MVP? All right, good, that's what I expect. Cool, all right, so I have, we're gonna settle it. I think we can settle it tonight, guys. I think we can settle it, you ready? So one of the big debates is, is a landing page. So a landing page is when you put up a marketing page to test, to, to kind of describe a product concept. Is a landing page an MVP or not? Who thinks, yes, a landing page is an MVP? Only two people, really? Three, four, five, okay. Who says no way, no way a landing page is an MVP? We have a lot of non-voters, I think. All right, cool, great, okay, cool. So, right, so I've literally seen blog posts that say the title, a landing page is an MVP, and they talk all about how they use a landing page, and then these people in the comments section torching them and saying that's ridiculous, it's not. And then the guy decided to wrote a counterpoint, a landing page is not an MVP blog post, right? So usually, I, I think because we have a product crowd here, it's a little more skewing one way or the other. But here's how it goes. So let me represent the landing page. People said yes. They said, well, you know, 
a landing page, we're going to get valuable information and learning from that. Anything that gets you learning, man, it's all good. That's an MVP. <laughs> Kumbaya, it's good. It's an MVP. We're learning from this thing. It's an MVP. That's what it means, right? That's kind of what they say. So their criteria is, hey, if you're learning, if you're testing your hypotheses and you're learning, it's an MVP. It's a very liberal, inclusive view of an MVP. The hardcore product people that raise their hands over here, I'll represent them now. It's like, are you crazy? Don't you know what the P in MVP stands for? It's product. I could create a landing page. I could sell you like snake oil on this landing page, but there's no product. Where's the product? There's no product behind it, right? You don't actually build anything. You're not testing any user experience. It's just you're testing a marketing claim is all you're really testing, right? Does that sound like what you guys would say, right? That's right. So and you're never, they're never going to get past that. You're never, that's what's going to happen. It's just that's not a product, it's not a product. So my way to get out of that trap is just to try to go up one level and call all those things MVP tests or experiments. So if we call them all MVP tests, because I'm a little more on the hardcore side myself, but if we call them MVP tests, then it's like, okay, well, it's a test. So we are learning from it. It's not really an MVP, but it's an MVP test. Okay, I think I can let, let it go and let a landing page be a test. So that's the debate that we get in. And then we can reserve the P, the true MVPs, for the things that are product, that feel product-ish. That's what we can do, right? So I, in my book, uh, and I want to share these frameworks, I divided the MVP, all the different, you know, there's a lot of different MVPs you hear about. So I just created a framework to categorize them so we can all get along and agree. We've got the product, so they're all called MVP tests, but we've got the true product test, the true MVPs here, and the other ones here. And I just call them marketing tests for lack of a better word, right? Because it's, you're really testing your marketing. It's really what you're doing, right? And then I also have qualitative and quantitative, because th that's not a dimension that we talked about yet, but there are those tests too. So what are the true things that most people would agree an MVP is, right? Certainly live product, no one would say, is, is that's certainly an MVP. Most people would also say like, hey, an interactive prototype is close enough that I'm testing an MVP. Um, you know, some walk-up, wireframes, walk-ups, uh, wire wireframes, mock-ups. And then like there's two types of MVPs you may have heard of, Wizard of Oz and Concierge, where you're kind of manually hacking behind the scenes, kind of like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain you know, something that's not automated or scaling, it's manual today, but you're kind of faking it, the customer doesn't know. In the Wizard of Oz, they don't know, in the concierge, they do know basically what's going on. So everyone can agree these are product tests basically, and those are great because you're actually testing your product concept and your ideas. Um, and you're usually qua qualitative, you're showing people these and getting feedback. The quantitative things here, obviously product analytics and A-B tests are quantitative ways to do it to test it. And there's one other one which is called Fake Dora 404. Zingo is famous for this where before they would launch a new game, they would put a little ad for the new game they were thinking about in their existing game and see how many people clicked on it to see what the demand was and express interest in that. That's the idea of a Fake Dora 404. So again, it's behavioral quantitative. Um, in the upper left, I just said marketing materials. I mean, you can get feed, qualitative feedback on a landing page, on a Google ad, a Facebook ad, right? On anything, a slogan, a tagline, an icon, a logo. There's so many different things you can get feedback on. I just call it all marketing materials. It is valuable for sure, especially your value prop, your value proposition. How you talk about the benefits and how you talk about your value prop is really, really important for it to resonate. Uh, and then finally over here we have, you know, there are quantitative uh, non-product tests or marketing tests. That's where a landing page test comes in, you know, also called a smoke test. What you want to do there, hopefully, is have some conversion action like, hey, uh, a buy button or you have to leave your email, right? And then you can see what percentage of people actually cross that bridge. They didn't actually use your product, so you're not really getting the hardcore product feedback, but you're getting feedback on your value prop and your messaging and seeing what the conversion rate. Explainer video is like the next level up. If it's too hard to explain your, con your product on a landing page because it's so complicated. A video, you know, can, can really help do that. So Dropbox is a famous example there where because it was kind of so complicated with how it was going to sync with the cloud and all this, he created an explainer video for his MVP to explain it and raise his funding. Ad campaigns are a great way to, val to do kind of demand, some degree of demand gen and, and marketing messaging validation. Obviously marketing A-B tests where now you're like, you're doing two different landing pages with two different slogans or two different images or two different calls to action. And then crowdfunding is awesome. So crowd, especially for the stuff that Mark's going to talk about next month, um, hardware, right? This has been a boon to hardware. It's like instead of having to build the hardware thing and then try to sell it and see if anybody wants to buy it, no, no, no. We create a, 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 a crowdfunding page on Kickstarter, right, or on one of these other sites, and we describe our product, then it's like, hey, click here to buy it, and once we get enough, we'll buy it. So it de-risks, it flips the risk equation around. So that's a great way to do an MVP. So 
Anyway, this is like the full arsenal of tools you have. Again, um, different degrees of fidelity and different approaches. And it's not about just using one. It's about using the right one to test the hypothesis at that point in time. So once we've picked the right type of MVP, I'm going to assume we're going to do a prototype. I'm a huge fan of interactive prototypes before you do any coding or building and testing with those. Let's say we're, we got clear on our value prop. We got clear on our features. We had the tough debates about MVP. And so we know what features we need. Now it's time to create our prototype. This is where UX design comes in. Because up until now, everything's just words. These are all words on Confluence or Google Docs or something like or PowerPoint or something, right? Now it's time to get to the user experience. The way I like to think about user experience is like an iceberg. Because like an iceberg, there's a part that's visible above the water that everybody sees and focuses on. But there's a lot more under the water that's not immediately obvious that people don't usually think about. The part above the iceberg, above the water line, that most people see and react to is visual design. We take in most of, most of our information through our eyes, maybe a little through our ears when we're listening, but mainly through our eyes. You are looking at my slides, the fonts, the shapes, the colors, all that, right? That's how we take in information. And that's what most people see and react to. But when there's a product um, that really does a good job you know, with product market fit and, and meeting customer needs and delighting them, it's because the product team has done a good job thinking at these other levels that these other layers that are below the waterline that aren't as obvious. And I don't have time to go into them in depth, but this is how I think about it. The foundation is a conceptual design. Like what's the fundamental conceptual approach for how we design this product? Um, in other talks I mentioned like the Uber design, not because it's map centric, but because basically, the cool thing about conceptual design is you can, des you can describe it visual verbally, like in a sentence or two. It doesn't actually depend on the pixels. So actually while we're here and into it, uh, the other one is, is Quicken. So when Quicken came out, there are already like 45 other personal finance packages out there, right? The founders though played around with them all and tried them out and said, you know what? None of these are, these are all really hard to use. None of these are easy enough to use. So they formed the hypothesis that, hey, if we deliver a personal finance application that's easy to use, we think we'll win in the market. That was their hypothesis of the problem space, what the issue was. Their conceptual design to deliver on ease of use was, at the time, everyone in the States used checkbooks. So they had this brainstorm of, well, if we make the UI look and work like a checkbook where you put in the payee, you put in the date, you put in the amount, the learning curve will be really shallow for people and it should be easy for them to use. So that was their conceptual design is let's use the checkbook metaphor for how we represent your financial data. And it paid off and they quickly um, became number one in that space, right? Uber, the conceptual design is not that it's map centric, but it's like, imagine we just said, okay, I'm gonna show the user in the middle of the map and we'll show the cars nearby where they are in real time. And when you pick a car, we'll show it as it drives towards you. That's a description of their conceptual design, if that makes sense. Um, information architecture is how you organize and structure the information in your product. If, um, if it's hard to find things and things aren't where you expect them to be, they've done a poor job. It's almost like this, this fades away. You don't even see it. You just don't, it doesn't even get in your way when it works really well. You just Things are where you expect them to be and you're kind of going through the, the product makes sense. Interaction design is anything your, the user can interact with, anything they can click or tap on. So buttons, forms, controls, navigation, that's interaction design. Um, and the main thing here is, you know, designers tend to be either stronger in visual design or stronger in like the interaction design or information architecture. It's really not to oversimplify the world, but there's kind of like two main types of designers. And so you can kind of tell if someone's got a visual, strong visual design, a lot of times I'll work with a startup client. I'll be like, do you have a designer? They're like, yeah, we have a designer. They're all excited because they have a designer. I'm like, cool. And I look at the mock-ups and they're like, they look beautiful, but they haven't really necessarily thought through the structure of it and the, and, you know, the, the ease of use isn't quite there. It looks good aesthetically. Conversely, you know, you might have someone who's really good at figuring out flows and things like that, but then the product doesn't look that great. Maybe they're more of it. It's great to have both. If you want to have both skills on your team, if you can, that would be great. All right, so once we're going to go after the design, you know, there's a range of artifacts that we can use to express the design. And another way, again, to think about it is we have just a bunch of words on at this point, right, in Confluence or Google Docs, and now it's time to actually go and do a visual design. There's a range of things we can do, and what I want to show you is a range of choices for those designs, design artifacts, and kind of a, prefer, a preferred flow to work your way through the design and to de-risk your design at the same time. And the way I like to categorize these is with fidelity. Fidelity is how closely does it resemble the final full live product, that would be the highest fidelity. And then interactivity is compared to the final product, how much can I interact with it compared to the, can I do all the clicks and interactions and taps that I could do, right? And the bottom left, the lowest interactivity, lowest fidelity, we have the awesome hand sketch, whether it's on paper or a whiteboard. This is a great first step to go from the words 
through the first sketch design sketches, right? And this is a good place for the team to iterate and explore different directions and get to the point where, like, hey, we like these one or two or three concepts. Then the next level up in fidelity and interactivity is clickable wireframes or tappable wireframes, basically, right? So wireframes, now you're using a digital wireframing tool like Balsamic. I'm a huge fan of Balsamic. Does anyone here use Balsamic? All right, cool. Does anyone here, well, you promise it. Anyone here not wireframe? You don't have to raise your hand. I guess cool. I would encourage you, if you have a wireframer, that's great. But if you don't, I would strongly encourage you. It's really, Balsamic makes it so easy to do, and it's very helpful. I don't, in other talks, I talk about how there's usually a design gap in a lot of teams or companies, and so it can be helpful to, to be able to wireframe. But anyway, wireframes are higher fidelity You're using a digital tool. And the cool thing, in the old days, they would be static wireframes. You would just do these static wireframes in Visio, and there's nothing you could click on. But these days, it's just built into Balsamic. If you add a menu in Balsamic, a widget, it's going to say, where do, you want, where do you want it to go when they click or tap that menu? If you add a link, it's going to say, where do you want it to go? So it has it all built in so that you can say, hey, when they tap this button, I want it to go to this other wireframe. And so you can string together multiple screens or pages. Um, you can't do every combination, but you can do what we call the happy path. Now, the other thing about wireframes is they tend to be grayscale. Why is that? Remember I said the visual design iceberg, the iceberg? <laughs> the number of times I've worked so hard with a team and we've had all these tough debates about who are our customers and what should our value prop be in those tough MVP discussions and, and then we finally get to the layout, how should we lay out the screens and then we take our, our mock-ups to the, to the hippo, uh, the key stakeholder, and the first thing they do is like, what's this color green? I don't like this color green that you guys used on this mock-up. So I like, I'm like, are you serious? Like, can we talk about the value prop and the MVP, right? So to, be, and it's, it's not their fault. If you're not trained in visual in design, you're not, it's hard to just not see the color, not see the visual design. So it's kind of like putting blinders on a horse. Wireframes, we just don't use any color. Then you can't tell me you don't like the color. We don't do the fonts yet. We don't do the images yet. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's symbolic representation, low fidelity, right? That's the other reason I, when I know when I'm working with a company, like, yeah, yeah, our designer will do it. And the first thing I get from them is like a sketch, high fidelity, pixel perfect thing. I know it's a visual designer probably because they just, you know, we haven't stopped to think about here. So it's kind of like building a car. Yeah, obviously, you know, what color the car is is important, but first we want to figure out how far should it go, what should the engine do, what should the foundation do, right? So anyway, so this is, this, this is also a good place where you can actually test with some customers um, here uh, and they'll know it's not a finished product because it's going to look rough, but that's where you can get good feedback on, hey, remember that debate we had about whether we had to have feature X in the MVP or not? Let's do a wireframe without it and then we see how many of these customers complain or not, right? That's where you can, that's an, it's an early way to test and see if they all complain. If they all complain, you say, okay, let's put it in. If they don't, you don't. The next level up is, you can test these with customers. Next level up is, and, and so you're basically working through your, your functionality hypotheses and your information architecture interaction design hypotheses there, the high level ones. The next level up is clickable mockups. Now we take those wireframes, we create high fidelity mockups. This is great because now we've got high fidelity and we've got interactivity. So this is where I love to use a tool like Envision. Has, have people here used Envision? So the cool thing about Envision is, you know, designers use different tools, Sketch, Illustrator, Photoshop, but at the end of the day, they export these images and, you know, they send you, you can get all the images and then you as a non-designer, non-technical person can upload all those screen images to Envision and then you can go in and say, okay, there's a, there's a register button here. I'm going to create a hotspot rectangle around that register button and when they click that, then it's going to go here. And so you can manually string together multiple screens and pages again. That is a really, really good way to, test. I love testing there. That's where I get most of my valuable feedback there. Um, and what you do is you test and you see what issues come up and, and I'll talk about the details of testing, but you're trying to just see what issues or problems come up, what things don't they understand, what's not working, and then you, you do batch after batch, wave after wave, until you get to the point where, you know what, those problems are going away and now people are saying, hey, I can actually, this looks pretty cool, I, I could see using this and how it would create value, and then finally we can produce, proceed to live product. Once you've, got, when you, you, once you've gotten to the point here where there's no concerns, and people are starting to give you positive feedback, you can confidently go to live product because you've tested it and you've worked out all the major kinks for the most part. Now, I do recommend testing your live product because one, this doesn't have any browser compatibility issues <laughs> with mockups, doesn't have any database performance issues or server performance issues or anything like that, and sometimes what you put in the dev pipeline isn't exactly what you get out the other side, so but it's good. Um, but So again, taking a step back, this is a way to go from words, right, words of your spec or your requirements 
and iteratively work through your design and test it with users to de-risk it uh, as you go through. This would be crystal clear. This is, sometimes people mix up the terms. This is a wireframe. Can you tell me you don't like the color green that we use? No, you can't, right? We put the horse blinders on. Grayscale, no pictures, you know, no fonts. Just, that's, you know, we're, just, we're, we're, we're using this to communicate what's on the screen, what's not, what's the relative size, what's the relative layout. That's what we're dealing with first. And then here next to it is a high fidelity mock-up of the exact same screen. Now you see we've introduced colors and images and, um, and, and things like that. So it's higher fidelity. That's what we mean by high fidelity versus low fidelity. All right, so let's assume we've got our nice shiny InVision prototype and we're ready to go talk with customers, right? Just to tie it back, we've gone all the way through the pyramid. We just finished step five. We have a shiny prototype that represents all our MVP and our value prop um, and we're ready to test with customers. There are three different types of tests you can do with customers. The first is in-person moderated. In in-person moderated, um, you and the customer are there in the same location at the same time and you are moderating them through the test. Right? So you can dynamically react to things that you see or questions that come up or ask questions dynamically. Remote moderated is you're doing it at the same time but you're just not in the same place. You're using Zoom or some other screen sharing video tool so that you can see their screen as they use the prototype or the live product. Um, and you can, and they, you know, you can communicate via the audio and video. And then finally, there's remote unmoderated. Here, you're not; it's not at the same time. So the way this works is, you might have some InVision prototype. You might use a tool like user testing and say, okay, I want 30 people that meet these criteria to go and hit this uh, InVision prototype. And here's a set of questions I want them to answer as they go through it. So it's unattended. You're not there. The advantage of that is you can get data very quickly because you can get 30, you can get 30 people doing it all at the same time and then you know 30 minutes later or an hour later you've got 30 data points. That's the advantage of it. The disadvantage is you better know, you better have a good handle on what questions or issues are going to come up that you want to ask because you can't dynamically, if something goes off the rails you can't jump in, you're not there to jump in and say oh actually what about this or what about that, right? So it's usually best not to jump right into unmoderated but like say you had, you knew you had a problem in a conversion flow, some conversion funnel, you knew this one step there was a problem but you didn't know where, how users were getting tripped up. That would be a good point maybe to aim some remote unmoderated tests at it and then you would say, oh okay, well people, here's why people are getting tripped up. Um, in general for the early product stuff, I like to do in-person moderated because you can, one I like to do moderated because you can do dynamic questioning and react to what you're seeing and actually you can even engage in brainstorming with the customer which is great, right? Um, and uh, in general I prefer in person because just the fidelity of the communication the data is just higher. Little subtle things like did the person sigh, like if you had a little sigh while you're looking at something. Or I can actually see where your eyes are looking on the screen if we're close enough, right? If it's remote or moderate, you, it's not a big deal but you lose those little things. Sometimes, um, you know, your customers just aren't where you are. So it can be more time efficient, you don't have to schedule things uh, as much. Uh, you don't have to like plan on travel and things like that. So remote moderated is fine. It's less of an issue these days, but it used to be also sometimes the technology gets in the way. You're sharing this prototype, but like the Zoom window's in the way, so they got to move it, all that jazz. So when you do in-person moderate, it's not as big an issue. All right, so those are three types. Oh, finally, I like to talk to users in waves of five to eight, maybe five to ten. Some people, you know, they want bigger sample sizes. The real thing is between eight and ten, there's not really a big difference, but five to ten, let's say. Um, and what we want to do is do like a batch of five to eight, and then we want to stop and pattern match the feedback that we got and process it and then act on that, iterate our, iterate our mock-up and then do another new fresh batch of eight people. That's how I like to do it and rinse and repeat until we get to the point where there are no issues anymore and we're starting to get a lot of positive feedback. That's the goal here. How do we structure the sessions? So I like to call it ROM and user testing. It's funny, we're here at Intuit. This is the first place I ever did user testing and usability testing. They had a million dollar usability lab here, right? Uh, pristine white room with like one way mirror, you know, like that and camera on the user's face and camera on the screen. Very fancy, very cool. After Intuit, I went to startups and, you know, we just have a user and a laptop and I'm sitting next to them. Like, you don't, so, you know, don't, you don't need to be fancy. So that's why I like to call it ROM and user testing. <laughs> the way I like to, because um, you don't really need a lot. So the way I like to do it is I don't like to jump right into the prototype. I like to spend 10 or 15 minutes on what I call warm up and discovery. Warm up is important because sitting down one on one with someone is not a normal interaction you have every day to say, I'm going to sit down with this stranger and they're going to show me this product and I'm going to tell them what I think about it. That's not something that you typically do and so it's kind of a, it's not a typical social situation. So the reality is the safer the person feels and the more rapport you can build, the more they're going to feel comfortable sharing information with you 
and being honest with you. You know, so that's the idea. It's a good investment aside from you know just being nice to the person. It's just good to build that rapport and let them know, hey, you know, we're both humans here, and you're, this is a safe place, and I respect you, and things like that. Right? So you're not going to be judged by what you say. Um, then also for discovery, right? You had a lot of hypotheses about. Oh yeah, we think that they don't have a lot of free time, and we think this is what they like to do, and we think they use this product. That's a great place to test those things, right? And when I do discovery, that's usually where I find out about these unknown competitors or substitutes that people, my clients didn't even know about. They're like, yeah, yeah, we're competing with software company A and B. And then I start asking people, well, you know, what do you use? And they start mentioning other things that aren't A and B, and you learn a lot about it. And you learn, then you ask them, why did you pick that? You know, why did you pick that or this? What do you like about it? What don't you? Then I like to um, get into getting feedback on the prototype. Now, an important distinction here is I like to be as non-direct as possible, as if I was not there. And they may, that may sound odd. And you may be thinking of like, in usability studies, there's a thing sometimes called, like the focus is on task completion rates. Like, okay, imagine we were Expedia, and we just wanted to like make sure it was easy enough for people to book flights on Expedia. We might create a scenario, it's like, okay, I want you to book a flight from SFO to Houston on these dates, and we would just like ask 10 users to do it, and they would either get a green or a red. They either did it successfully or they didn't. And then we would take the number that did successfully, say it was eight, and say we have an 80% task completion rate. That is extremely usability focused. That is not about product market fit at all. That's not the kind of testing I'm talking about here. Of course you're going to get UX feedback. Of course you're going to get UX feedback. But we really want to get at the product market fit part of it too and the needs, right? So this may seem weird, but the way I like to do it is I just I pull up the Envision prototype, you know, and then, and then I just like, shut up. <laughs> and then it's a little awkward silence, and so the person usually goes, uh, or I might say something like, hey, it'd be great to get your feedback on this product. Like, I'm not, it's a complete silence. But I don't, my point is I don't direct them. So then most of the time, sometimes people jump right in, but most users, most customers will go, so uh, what should I do? You know, like what should I do? And I give this pat answer and I say, do whatever you would do if you were home by yourself or in your office by yourself. It's a work park, right? Because that's the truth, right? The truth is you're not going to be there to hold every user's hand when you launch your product. So I want it to be as real world prototypical as possible. And so then after I say that, some people are off to the races, they start registering or doing whatever. But a lot of people, they still, they look at the screen for a little bit and they say, so, so should I register? What do you think I say? I say, do whatever you would do if you were home by yourself. I'm a broken record until they realize I am not going to hold their hand. And then they finally, after one or two times, they realize this is not a test. I'm not going to push the rat through the maze, the mice through the maze. They've got to do it themselves. So then they realize it. So then they start doing it, right? Um, and, and, and what I do, so then you may be like, well, Dan, well, what, when do you ask, how do you ask any questions? Or what do you do? What I do is I kind of wait for something to happen that's relevant, and then I kind of pounce. So if I see them trying to figure out where to register, I'll let them dangle in the wind for like a minute or two, and then I'll be like, hey, can you tell me what's going on? You know, I, I see you're moving your mouse around. Can you, can you let me know what's going on? What's, what's going on? And then they'll say, they might say, well, I'm having trouble finding the registration button, right? So that's, that's how I would do it, right? Or if they're going through some flow and they'd be like, oh, that was weird. You know, they say that out loud. That's when I like pounce and go, oh, can you tell me what, what was it that you found was weird, right? And then we'll dive down the rabbit hole of whatever comes up, right? So it's not like I have a script ahead of time. I'm going to ask these five questions and I'm going to work through my menu. It's not like that. Or you think of the game of croquet and you got to get through the wickets. There aren't wickets that I want to go through. I want free exploration and then I'm going to dynamically ask what comes up. That's basically what I'm going to do. Or if I hear, that's where the sigh comes in. If I see him doing something, they go, you know, or they make some noise, I, and if I can tell something's going on. Or if they like it. Sometimes, a lot of times, they're doing something like, cool. They'll say that, right? And then I'll be like, oh, what was cool? Tell me what was cool. And then we'll dive into it. Why was it cool? All that kind of jazz, right? So that's how I like to do it. Um, so I non-directed as if I wasn't there, like I'm a fly on the wall, but then when I observe something, that's when I jump in and I ask questions. And I ask very open-ended questions, but I do go deep to understand. Now, uh, at the end, the other thing is I don't like to break, I don't break character. It's like I'm not there. It's like I'm not there. So if, say, we were doing a live product in alpha, and the dev team just pushed an update, and the stuff's not working, 
Oh well, like that's that's what's going to happen. Hopefully, someone from the dev teams in the session, or hopefully, you know, the designers are in the session too. Like, I'm not going to go and jump in and save them. Just be like, okay, you know, at the end of the test, that's when I'll I'll break character and I'll say, oh, remember when you were trying to do that one thing? That's our fault. We have a bug on the alpha. So, you know, the alpha version has a bug. You know, that's when I'll bring it up, right? Or I answer questions. A lot of times they'll they'll try to look at you for answers. Like, should I click here or should I click here? I'll be like, do whatever you do if you're home by yourself, right? And then at the end, you can engage. I'll break character. The other thing is if for some reason they didn't get to some key feature that you wanted them, they didn't organically get there, then it's perfectly fine to say, okay, hey, uh, thanks for that. I want to put you on this one page and I want to get your feedback on this page and we just kind of do that. And then definitely ask if they would use the product. So again, you're getting kind of this, this feed, you're getting some UX feedback, a mix of UX feedback and product market fit feedback, right? And in the beginning, you're going to get a lot of UX feedback. Like, I don't understand this. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to click. And you're also going to get a lot of, frankly, messaging feedback. What does this word mean? What does this mean? I don't understand what this is. I don't understand. I don't understand. That's what's going to happen a lot. And I found this, my, my, this the hard way. When I did my startup, I practiced this. And we had a private beta. And I'd you know, meet someone at some party or something and be like, oh, what's your startup? Oh, cool, private beta. Can I get in the private beta? I'd be like, yes, you can get in the private beta. The cost of entry is you got to come to our office and do a one-on-one -on -one user test. I want to watch you sign up and watch you do it. So I did 80 of those in a row before we launched the TechCrunch. Um, and so the first 15, you know, I think I'm a pretty decent product person and UX person, but the first 15, we had UX issues. We had issues with messaging. People didn't understand what we used. They said, hey, you know what, I could really use some examples here. So we, we fixed those issues. Uh, we fixed some bugs. We improved the UX. We added some instructions. We added some examples. And after about the 15th test, you know, so I'm doing these one at a time and we're just dynamically, we're really fast, like launching new features every day, fixing stuff every day. After the 15th test, there were, those issues were gone, like no more issues, right? And about the 20th test, people were sailing through and getting to the main, getting through registration and setup and getting through the main screen. So then I started feeling pretty good. I was like, yeah, all right, cool. At the end of these tests, I, obviously the other tests, I wasn't going to ask them if they would use it because there were problems that came up. But now there were no problems. There were no usability issues at all. Not a single usability issue came up. So at the end of it, I was saying, hey, so would you use this product or not? And to my surprise, 15% of people said, no, I would never use your product. Even though there wasn't a single complaint or issue, like not a single complaint or issue during the test. So I was perplexed. I'm like, what the heck? Like, it was easy to use. They knew what they were doing. Or what's going on? So I said, oh, can you tell me why? And what it turns out is, I didn't realize this, this product was like a news reader product, kind of a news discovery product. And it turns out, the first thing that they would say is, well, I just don't like to get my news this way. That's how they would say it. I don't like to get my news this way. And I was like, wow. I'm like, well, how do you like to get your news? <laughs> and so then they proceeded to tell me how they like to get their news. I'm like, oh, OK. It makes sense. If you like to get your news that way, this isn't going to make sense. So then when I started doing it, I'm like, huh, some, there's a mystery here. What's going on? 15% right? of people. So in the beginning, in the discovery, I started asking people, how, can you tell me how you like to get your news? That was a new question I wasn't asking. So I started asking that up front. I started realizing. Wow, of course, news, like, it's a big consumer need. It makes sense that like, one size won't fit all. So it turns out, after I started asking the discovery, I realized there's three main ways. Now, it's oversimplifying a bit, but there are three main ways that people like to get their news. Our product was, unbeknownst to us, optimized for the way that we, the founding team, like to get news, right? <laughs> Luckily, it was like a big percentage of the market like to get their news that way. And the second biggest way, our solution worked pretty good to get the news that way. But this third way, there was no way. It was just was fundamentally anti, the opposite of how they like to get their news. So it was actually a good learning and discovery. So that helped me go back and add a segmentation attribute that I didn't have to my target customer. What was that? You know, how they like to get their news. An attitudinal, if you will, attitudinal or need and or needs based segmentation criteria I didn't have before. Turns out they're really, they're not in my target market. Luckily it's a big enough market without them. 85% of the news market is fine. So anyway, that's the thing. Usability and product market fit are orthogonal. Usability and UX issues will get in the way of you achieving product market fit, but once you clear those, you, you may not have product market fit as I found. Some quick do's and don'ts. Most people are nice. They don't want to hurt your feelings, especially if they figure you're involved. If you're the PM or the designer, and they think that's the case, most people are nice. So you need to debunk that at the beginning of the interview in that warm-up session. You say, hey, you know, um, please don't worry about hurting my feelings. The whole reason we're talking to people is to make this better before we ship it. Like, so now's the time. If you tell us now, it's actually the least painful time to give us constructive criticism. So please, you're actually helping us by telling us how we can make it better. So you need to kind of tell that up front. The other thing is not everybody is super chatty. Again, this is an odd interaction, sitting down one-on-one -on -one with someone. 
A lot of people just clam up and are very quiet, or they're naturally quiet anyway, so they're certainly not going to be loud in this kind of situation, talkative in this situation. So to debunk that, you just kind of say a front look. I know um, this is probably not a typical interaction you have, but I'm going to be showing you this prototype. And if you could just please, you know, whatever thoughts are going through your head, if you could please verbalize those and just share those out loud so I know what you're thinking, that would be great. Sometimes you give those instructions and people comply. A lot of times, even after you say it once, you get crickets and silence from the person who's like, you know, it's like silently checking out your prototype, not saying a word to you, right? So then I'll remind them again. I'm like, hey, just remember, if you could just please try to do it. And then sometimes, sometimes even after two or three reminders, it's just crickets and you're just going to get that. I call those people duds. You're just going to get some duds. Between no-shows and duds, it's probably about 10%. So just always schedule 10% more than you want to get the data points. No big deal. Um, be a fly on the wall. Don't stick your finger in the pie. And this is why I didn't say it. it can be hard. I know. If you're the product manager and you're showing them this new prototype, you're secretly sitting there hoping, yeah, find the registration button. Fine, click it. Get through reg. Get through reg. Great. Use the feature. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're seriously cheering along and hoping that they do it. And you may even ask a question, you know, uh, do you like this feature or not? <laughs> you know, and you're secretly saying, please say yes, please say yes, please. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah right. So I know that, it, but you want to just be a fly on the wall. Don't try to help them through and get, don't cheat on the test, if you will, right? And definitely take notes. There's a lot going on, a lot of information. Um, if you're an advanced moderator, you might be able to take notes and moderate. I know people that can do that. But if you're not, then just have a separate note taker, right? Just you're the moderating, you're the note taker. You each will see different things and hear and perceive things differently. So it's great to compare notes right away. Like do the debrief that day. Don't let it sit for a week because you'll forget about it. Um, also, don't rely on the video, the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll go back and watch the video. Nobody ever goes back and watches the video. We know this, right? So you just want to take the keynotes. And I have a little system, like, it's not a complicated system, but like, when somebody says really important, because there's a lot of notes you're taking, I put like asterisk next to it. So then I can just go back and scan the asterisk for the things I know I want to go back and, and, and discuss with my team members. Um, the other thing is, you know, how big are people? You don't want too many people. The more people in the room with the respondent, the more self conscious they're going to feel, the more risk of being judged or you know, thought that someone's going to be judging them or thinking bad things about them. So two or three max is good. If you want to have more people, you can have a separate. Zoom is great for that, too. You can secretly have the people on the Zoom. Just make sure they're muted, right? Secretly uh, watching what's going on. Um, some don'ts. Fight that urge. I know it's your baby, but fight the urge to help them or explain it to them, right? The product needs to stand on its own. So you want it to stand on its own, not be there to help people through the wickets. Don't get defensive or blame the user. The number one thing, who here has conducted user interviews? A lot of people, great. So if you haven't conducted them, and you haven't conducted them because you were nervous or felt like you didn't know how or anything like that, I will here tell you there are a lot of things that are hard in product. This is one of the most easily learned things. It's basically talking to humans. It involves active listening. But there's one main trick that makes a big difference in the quality of the data that you get. And it literally has to do with how you ask the questions. And what you want to do is avoid leading questions. A leading question is when you, it's really not a question. It sounds like a question, but it's not a question. It's a question where you bake the answer that you want into what you say to the person. So if I say to you, hey, Ian, that was easy to use, wasn't it? What's he going to say? Yes. Unless he's like, you know, got major backbone and he's got major issues. He's going, actually, no, it was not. Or he's, gonna, he's just going to go, yes, right? Because again, this is an awkward interaction. We just want this. I want to give you the simplest possible answer to move us forward and get this thing done with and get my check for 100 bucks. That's what I and we're done and get back to my life, right? So yes, no, yes, no, yes, right? So he's going to say yes. That's a leading question when you put the answer in, right? And again, you may secretly be like, yes, they all said yes to, do they like my feature or not? It was easy because you led the questions. It's easy to game the test. Not as bad, but still bad, is a closed question. So in a closed question, you're not putting the answer in, but you're limiting the possible responses from the person, right? If instead of saying that was easy to use, wasn't it, I said, did you like that feature? What are the likely responses I'm going to get? Yes, yes or no, right? That's it. That's, that's all I'm going to get. And again, as an eager beaver PM, I may be like, please say yes, please say yes, please say yes. And you say yes, and I go, yay, and second you say yes, right? And I move on to the next question. But what did I learn from them saying yes? I may be excited that 80% of customers I talked to said yes, but what did I learn? I didn't learn why she liked it. I didn't learn why the other 20% didn't like it. So the learning actually, it, and again, it, we moved on. The customer goes, yes, and we're done with that question. Now we're on the next thing. Are we done yet? You know, kind of thing, right? So literally, that's the two things to avoid that will make a night and day difference in the quality of your interviews. And it's super easy. It literally has to do with 
what words do you start your questions with? Okay? So for closed questions, anytime you start a question with do you, did you, does, are you, was that, you are setting yourself up for a yes or no question. And at first, of course, you won't be noticing what you're doing, but once you realize it, you know, you can have your note taker, you also talk to your note taker and say, hey, if I ask a closed-ended question, make sure you let me know. And you debrief afterwards. So that's it. That, that, it's that simple. Instead of starting questions like that, say questions that start with how, what are your thoughts on, what feedback do you have on, why, right? Those are open-ended questions. I can't just say yes. What do you think about that? Yes, yeah, it doesn't work, right? So, and actually think about what they have to do. If I just say, do you like that feature? Am I even gonna engage my brain? I'm just gonna say yes. I'm gonna give you an insta yes, because one, I don't wanna hurt your feelings. Two, it's the quickest, easiest, socially acceptable thing to say. And three, it's gonna move us on to the next, move along, I can move along, all right, we're going, right? If instead I say, hey, can you tell me what you thought about that feature? What has to happen now? They can't just say yes without thinking, the short cutting their brain. They have to go, well, they have to stop. They have to reflect on everything that they've seen during this session. They need to formulate a response and tell me their response. I'm going to get much richer information from that person. It's like an essay question versus a multiple choice question. You're going to get way more information. And the whole point is, you know, if everybody just says what you expect, you're not really getting value out of that test. You're not learning anything, right? If it's just 100% validation, so there's a, just a fundamental insight that learning on these tests, learning happens when you get surprised by something. When somebody says, no, I wouldn't use your product, when you fully expect them to because there was no issues. That's when you learn. That's how you peel the onion is when you learn is how you peel the onion and achieve higher levels of product market fit. Okay, so here's some, um, some new slides that I put together for this talk about, okay, how does, I get it, Dan, we're gonna be interviewing users using this stuff with our proto Envision prototypes, batches of five to eight, one at a time, that's great. When I do that, I got pages of notes. What the hell do I do with those notes? I get it, but I have all these notes. What do I do? Let me show you how I like to think about how I like to do it. I call this synthesizing customer feedback. Let's say I have my Envision prototype and I'm testing with five users, okay? I like to just kind of create a, a, a grid. I don't know yet. There's nothing in the grid at first. All I have right now is categories. There's three categories, main categories, you're typically gonna get feedback on. Feature set, like, hey, this feature's missing, right? Or I don't like this feature. UX design, like, hey, I can't find the login button. And messaging, I don't understand what that word means, or I don't like that word, or whatever, right? Those are kind of three high-level categories. You can create your own categories if you want. And then what I like to do is have some kind of, at the end, it's not quantitative, because I'm only talking to five people, but at the end, have some kind of scale question, like, hey, on a scale of 1 to 10, how valuable do you find this? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how easy is it to use, right? That's going to be some noisy data, but over time, hopefully you can see those numbers moving over time as you make progress. So that's the idea. So then I go and I talk to user 1, and I show her the prototype. I have no idea what she's going to say or what the feedback is, right? So what did I learn from her? Uh, she, we had feature X in our prototype. She said, oh, this is, this is valuable. So we got some positive feedback. So I put plus signs with the positive feedback, negative with the negative feedback, right? So we got the positive thing. Hey, this feature looks like it's valuable. Um, but where was feature Y? She was complaining that feature Y, maybe the head of sales was right, that we needed to have feature Y in there, right, after all. So um, they had trouble with register. They didn't tell us they had trouble. We saw they had trouble. They couldn't figure out how to register. So we observed that. Um, she happened to mention that on her homepage she liked the hero image that we had there. That's cool. And then I asked her for valuable and easy to use scores and that's the numbers that she gave me, right? That's a kind of summarizing the key takeaways from that session, right? Those might be the things that I would have the asterisk next to. I'm going to capture a lot of other notes, not just these, but this is like the key takeaways, right? That's that. Now I don't know, is any other user going to mention these same things or not? At this point, I don't know. I know one user did, right? So then I go to the next user test. Lo and behold, user 2 also says feature X was valuable. And he also complained that feature Y was missing. He actually didn't have a problem with registration. He got through OK, but he didn't see the sign-up link. He had trouble seeing the sign-up link. And then he happened to com comment that our, he thought our design looked professional. So that's good. The other person didn't say that, but he did. He didn't say anything about our hero image, but he did say that, you know, that tagline is confusing. I don't understand what your tagline is. Right? And then we asked him for valuable and ease of use scores, and that's what he gave us. Does that make sense? So we're summarizing what the second person did. Then we go on to user three. They, they, they didn't say anything about feature X. They also complained about feature Y missing. Um, so there's a pattern emerging there. He also had difficulty with registration. He didn't say any of these things. He, liked, he said he liked our hero image and that's it and those were his scores. Yeah? 
And then we go to the next person and you know they echoed that one, they didn't say that, they said those three, they said that one, not that, those are their scores. We go to user five, yada, 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 right? No new issues are emerging. They're either saying the old ones or they're not, right? And so now we're done with our wave. That's our wave of five. That's what I mean by a wave. And if you want to do eight or 10 instead, great. If you're like, Dan, five seals a little low, fine, do eight or 10, that's fine. Your chi-square is not gonna work out either way, guys, just so you know, okay? <laughs> you're not gonna be satisfied, but it's cool. So then what we do is I like to do, summarize this. I like to call, I call this qual on quant or semi-quant, where we summarize the wave. And we just say, okay, I know it was five or 10 people, it is 80%, I'm not saying it's 80% in, you know, in the infinite population, but that's what it is, right? So we can categorize these issues about what people had, right? Now, when you have four out of five people, or eight out of 10 people running into a problem, do you put on your spot cat and go, wait a minute, I need to talk to 10,000 more people before we see if there's a problem here or not, so my chi-square works out. You know, right? If 80% if, if or more people have a problem, it's probably a real problem there, right? 40%, 30%, now we're getting gray. Even 60% is probably material, right? Anyway, that's the idea. So we, now we use this and we say, okay, we summarized our way. What should we do? What, what do we want to iterate on, right? It, what, we would obviously, I think we would, I would argue, we, you know, that's great that feature X was valuable. Do we need to do anything there? No, we're good, it's positive feedback. What's the top negative feedback we need to react to? We need to add feature Y. I guess, like, I guess that MVP debate, we, we were on the wrong side of that. We did need to have feature Y in there, right? So we would say, okay, for our next iteration, we're gonna add feature Y. And maybe that would be all that we add, but I would probably be a little more aggressive and say, okay, let's try to fix, let's try to fix these registration <laughs> issues if we can. And let's try to you know, get this sign up link fixed, right? And then, you know, why not, if we can, you know, taglines are easy to change. So let's try to do that. That would be our to-do list. And we would iterate and say, okay, let's go rework our designs based on that. We're adding, reworking our feature set here, reworking our designs, and we come up with a new prop mockup and we go and test wave two. So what does this look like across waves? I'm not gonna go into the details of each wave. All I'm gonna do now is show you the summary data for each wave, right? So here we go, we go, we, there's, the, there's the things that we were acting on. Red means bad that we need to address. That's what, we, and, and uh, by the way, I didn't mention this. I took the median scores uh, here, right? I summarized all these with a median, right? That's what I did there, basically. So we got seven and five. It's okay. I mean, I, I certainly would like the valuable to be higher than seven. I definitely want the ease of use to be higher than five, but hey, that's where it makes sense because there's no feature Y. That'll probably make the value go up. And there's UX issues here, so that'll probably make the ease of use go up. So that's wave one, and then I go out and I test with another batch, wave two, and here's what I find. Before, 80% of people said that it was missing. Well, we added it, and this time, 0% of people said it. So mission accomplished. We had a full, we fully eliminated that, as near as we can tell, that complaint. Now, however, we have a new complaint, which is, oh, that's great that you added feature Y, and they didn't know that feature Y wasn't there. That's the funny thing. But they see feature X, they see feature Y, and like 80% of them said, hey, these two really need to work together. You know, it's cool that you have these features, but there's this key thing that they need to do together. All right, so we got a new learning here. Registration, uh, now 0% of people, so our designers did a good job redoing that flow. However, there's still 40% of people who don't see the sign up link. So we did, a, we did a design tweak there. It got a little bit better maybe, but we didn't quite solve that problem yet. And then by the way, now we got new feedback that feature Y is in there, but 80% of people are saying it's too hard to use. They can't figure it out. Does that make sense? And then now we, the new tagline looks like everybody like, you know, there's no problems with the new tagline. And our scores have gone up a little bit on the median of a small sample size, but the median has gone up. Does that make sense? That's wave two. Then we say, okay, what are our to-dos now? All right, we gotta go make features X and Y work together. Let's redo this signup link, V3 of the signup link, and then let's go figure out how to make feature Y easier to use. That's our to-dos now. We go out, we do wave three. Lo and behold, we do a good job here. Now those two work together. Uh, the sign-up link, we finally cracked that nut. Looks like whatever we did worked. However, feature Y is still not as easy to use. Like 40% of people are still saying this is too complicated and hard to figure out. Uh, our value score has gone up, but our ease of use score hasn't gone up to where we want it to yet. We go, we fix, now our only to-do is this guy. We go out there and we get all green, we get zero, and now we're at 99. Does that make sense? That's kind of so again, you don't know what's gonna come up, right? But that's what you do, you're capturing the key takeaways 
across feature set, UX design, and messaging, and you're coming up with the to-do list. Now, in this case, we had long, you know, three or four items per iteration. If that's too much, maybe you just bite off one or two, that's fine, but you pick off the biggest ones. And as I said, remember, we're going through this loop, hypothesize, design, test, learn, and I mentioned problem space, solution space. What's going on here, if we superimpose this, is we are using, we're, you know, we're forming hypotheses in problem space. We're coming up with these prototypes in the solution space. We're using these prototypes as a way to test our problem space hypotheses. We're testing in the solution space, we're learning from users, and then we're taking those learnings and we're revising our hypotheses. So that's the idea. We're, so you can think about it as like, you've got to have your mental model and all your stuff figured out, and the prototype is the representation of that that you use to test those with users, basically. Now hopefully everything goes well, product market fit just keeps going, 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 going. <coughs> that doesn't always happen. The way I like to think about product market fit is, it's kind of like climbing a mountain. And the higher up on the mountain you get, the more product market fit you have. And you start at the bottom of the mountain, everyone starts at the bottom of the mountain with a new product, and say you launch your V1 and you get that high. And you do what we just said, you listen to the feedback, okay, I think we got some things to fix, and you fix some things and you get up and you get up, right? In an ideal world, you keep climbing up and up and up. What I showed before is kind of more climbing up and up and up. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes you get stuck. You're like, gosh, we fix the things that are obvious, but we don't, we keep trying to change things, but we're not really getting any higher on the mountain. You may have to consider pivoting, basically, and a pivot just means that you change one of the key hypotheses, like who your target customer is, what your value prop is, what that MVP feature set is, right? And it's a pyramid again, so the farther down you change that key assumption, the whole pyramid could be crumbling down from that point higher, right? But this happens a lot, you know? You go out there with a certain idea, and people will say, yeah, that's cool, but let me tell you about this other thing that really is a problem, right? And these, these mountains, these mountains represent the market opportunities, a set of people with a set of needs. And maybe you start on one mountain and you realize by pivoting, you can get higher up another mountain, an adjacent market, if you will, right? So that's basically what's going on um, that might come up at some point in time. You might have to say, well, we thought it was gonna be this need for this market, but we pivoted and did that. And this happens all the time. And the way I like to think about it is, Customers will guide you if you do this well, right? If you listen to them and your 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 designs, you know, are, are high enough fidelity in their activity, and you do conduct the user research well enough, they will guide you. They'll tell you what they like, what they don't like, and they will pull you. The market will pull you in the right direction towards higher product market fit. It reminds me when I used to work early in my career on submarines. When a submarine shoots a torpedo at something, it doesn't have to get the angle exactly right. It just kind of needs to be in the general like, you know, cone or triangle, and then it kicks in and it homes in. That's how I feel like this. You don't need to be exactly right the first time. You just need to get in there, get out there, start testing your ideas, and people will pull you in the right direction, basically. All right, I want to close out with a case study of applying this process end-to-end. -end. The case study here was marketingreport.com. It's the one from the book. <coughs> Excuse me, let's get a drink of water here. And I'll put this up while we're waiting here. So it was a startup that had an existing product, but the CEO, CEO had a new product idea, and he wanted to validate it. He wanted to test it and validate it. And so it was a really small team, me, the CEO, his VP of marketing, and a designer. And we wanted to see if there was a business opportunity. And he was the one, he had a really small dev team, so he said, hey, we, we have to do as much as we can without coding. So I said, this is great, we're gonna use interactive prototypes to do this. <clears throat> and basically, the idea, let me explain the idea, was a marketing report. Like say after this, after this talk, I go back to my house and I go to my mailbox and I grab my mail and there's a coupon for cat litter addressed to me, Dan Olson. Why did I get that coupon for cat litter? Well, it's because there's some marketing database in the cloud that thinks Dan Olson has a cat. That's why, right? And the idea is it was analogous to a credit report. Like today, we're very empowered and have a lot of transparency into what your credit scores are, right? If somebody says you didn't pay a bill on time but it's wrong, you can challenge it and get it fixed and all that, right? But a long time ago, it wasn't like that. It was more of a black box where you would apply for a loan or credit card, you put in your social security number, it would go off to some database in the cloud and come back and say approved or declined, basically. Um, excuse me one sec, guys, I got a cough. much talking. I'll wrap it up here. And, and so he wanted to do what the transformation that happened in the, he had worked in the credit industry, so he saw that transformation. So he wanted to do the same thing for why do you get the marketing mail? Do you get, why do you get the direct mail is a euphemism for junk mail. Right? Who gets junk mail here? 
They found you guys too, huh? Okay, cool, right? <laughs> so step one is who's your target market? You all raised your hands, like everybody in the US who gets junk mail. That was step one, target market. Step two is what are the needs, the problem space that we, and, and that we wanna go after? <clears throat> so I work with them to map this out on a whiteboard. The top benefit, as best as they could explain it was, learn why I received the junk mail that I received. Why did I get this lit, uh, coupon for cat litter, right? That was the top problem space, and then mapping the solution, the top solution idea was a marketing report, which was like a credit report. So it had like a marketing profile, like Dan has a cat, Dan has two kids, Dan has a house, and then a marketing score, which was like a credit score, like hey, the higher the better kind of a thing. That was the core idea, core problem, and core solution feature idea that we have. One of the executives said, that's cool. In addition to that, I'd like to test out the secondary ideas of money-saving offers. What if <coughs> I don't have a cat, but I have a dog. Can I raise my hand and say, please send me dog food coupons? Like I would value getting money saving relevant coupons. So that was money saving offers. He had a hypothesis that people might want to compare their spending habits to other people. Oh, how much are you spending on dog food? Compare my spending a lot, more, whatever, what's going on? That was his hypothesis. And then because social networking was hot at the time, social networking. No real rhyme or reason, just it was the hot trend at the time, so that was in there. The other executive didn't care at all about the blue boxes. They mainly cared about the green box. But they said, well, what about the secondary benefit, just testing the overall benefit of reducing your junk mail? And then we brainstormed and said, well, exploring the problem space, right? We came up with something kind of creative, I think, which is, well, if we're saving all this paper, maybe we can make some environmental, you know, green save trees uh, benefit claim. So we iterated to get to this point. I said, okay, is everyone's idea on the board? And they said, yes. Next step in the process, what's our MVP going to be? I looked at this with an eye towards an MVP and I said, this is just too big for a single MVP. So what I did is we actually created two MVPs. Both MVPs had this functionality in it, right? The first MVP concept was called the marketing shield because it had the core green stuff plus the yellow stuff that was reducing your junk mail, kind of shielding you from junk mail. So we called that the marketing shield concept. The other MVP concept had the green stuff as well, but it had the blue stuff in addition to it, right? So the green stuff was identical, pixel identical between the two concepts. We just don't want to have too many features. So the shield concept had the green features plus the yellow, and the saver had the yellow, uh, or the green features plus the blue. Next step, let's create our Here's marketingreport.com, here's the homepage. I'd call it medium fidelity. You know, it's not a crude balsamic sketch, but we also didn't put a lot of time and effort into worrying about making it look really pretty. That was that. Uh, and then when you clicked in, this was kind of like the main page. And what we did is each of those functionality blocks uh, from the MVP was just one of these blocks. And we would just mix and match the blocks. So the saver concept had the saver blocks and the shield concept had the shield blocks. And then each of the blocks had a learn more button where you'd click down to go interact with that feature. So overall it was about a nine page prototype that we had, all right? So we had our prototype down. What's the next step? Step six, close the loop and talk with customers to see what they think. So now, I didn't talk about this explicitly, but I alluded to it before, which is whatever your proto persona attributes are, the salient attributes, now is when you want to basically write a survey where you ask people to see if they match or not. That's why it's called a screener. You're screening people in or out. Do they match? It's just a survey where you ask those key segmentation questions of demographics, uh, psychographics, behaviors, right? So what we did, we did two things. Um, we used a research firm, a uh, 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 brick and mortar one that had local people. These days they're digital equivalents online like user testing, validately, um, userinterviews.com, those are all options now that will find you users that meet your criteria. And we had two levels of screening. One is what I would call a hygiene one, which is we're, you know basically a lot of times you get students and retirees overrepresented in research because they have more free time, right? So that you get a lot more. And so we said, all right, let's just make sure these are like full-time working adults, not unemployed, not part-time, not retired, not students. So that was like, you know, there were a couple other just what I would call general hygiene questions to make sure someone's like truly in the, in the market. Then to get the fit part, we said, okay, um, if the saver is going to save you money, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to say, do you like to save money on the survey? Everybody likes to save money, right? So we made, a, we made a logical leap and said, okay, let's get at if they'd like to save money by asking some behavioral questions of things that we think indicate that that's important to them. So we brainstorm, hey, do you use coupons? Do you have a Costco membership? Do you have a Sam's Club membership? That kind of stuff, right? We had like five questions. And if they said yes to three of those, then they were like, okay, you're a saver. Same thing for the shield. We said, hey, if this is about privacy, and security, maybe they're like, we have a paper shredder, they have antivirus, they have caller ID blocking, all that kind of stuff. 
and some people were in both. It worked pretty good, just that simple behavioral segmentation to kind of screen people in a little bit. And then I, once we had the users recruited, I moderated them through the, through the prototype. What did I learn? Here's the same diagram color coded. So there were a lot of concerns and questions in this test. It didn't go particularly well. <clears throat> so green doesn't mean like, yeah, slam dunk, ship it, we're good. Green means, well, there were questions and concerns, but we feel like we have a good handle on it. And if we iterate based on what we learned, we can, we can create some value there. There's an opportunity to create value there. Yellow meant there's low appeal. Red meant they hated it or just didn't understand it at all, right? So the first thing is, did we find any green? There's no guarantees, especially the first time you do this, that you're gonna have any green. We had green, we had a little island of green here in the shield concept, and a little island of green in the saber concept. The thing is, was any of the, remember what was the core idea? This was the core idea. Did we have any green in the core idea? No. Thank goodness we tested something else, so this would have been a much more depressing result, right? That's what I mean. You go out, like we went out with this idea, we just happened to test these adjacent ideas, you know, and people said, ah, that's not too interesting, but this is cool and this is cool. That's what people do if you, if you get out there and listen to them, right? The other thing is the red. I'm just as proud of the red as I am of the green. Not surprisingly, social networking, they just got like added on for no logical reason, did not test well. Also, marketing score. Who here knows what a marketing score is? I don't know what a marketing score is and I worked on this project, but I know it would have taken an expensive third party data feed because we didn't have the data. It would have taken a lot of expensive engineering time to develop an algorithm and compute it. It would have taken a lot of money to educate customers on why they should care about their marketing score. But guess what? Nobody liked it. They all hated it. So we can trim that fat. So it's just as valuable to eliminate the, the low value stuff as it is to find the high value stuff. And we talk about pivoting, right? We started here and we decide we're going to pivot here or we're going to pivot here. Pivoting happens all the time. Right? And if you do this right, like the torpedo, it'll guide you, right? A um, couple quick examples. Flickr, you all know Flickr, the photo site, right? <clears throat> it started out as a game site. And the gamers were working remotely, and they developed this app that made it really easy to share their photos. And that's what ended up getting traction and taking off with people. That same entrepreneur later went to do another game. And the developers, and they all wanted a way to stay in touch and chat with each other. And that product ended up taking off and becoming Slack. A lot of you probably use Slack. You may not know it came from a game. It's actually the same person, Stuart, and they say he's the world's worst but richest game designer in the world, basically, right? So I would love to develop a game with him one day. That would be great. So um, anyway, we talk about pivoting. We had to decide we're going to pivot here, we're going to pivot here, right? And um, we decided to pivot to this island of green for a few reasons. One is I mentioned they already had existing brand and product. This was more consistent with their existing brand and product. Secondly, back to uh, the money saving offers, that would have taken a lot of time to go out and sign the partnerships and contracts and all that jazz. So our time to market would have gone out. And then thirdly, money saving offers back to value prop. We didn't have a good answer for how we were going to be better or different at money saving offers than the other companies that were already doing it. So for those reasons, we pivoted to these two boxes. We let go of everything else. We cut everything else and just said, let's focus on these two boxes, right? And it was super easy. We just threw out our prototypes and we started with a fresh piece of paper because we hadn't done any coding. There was nothing you know, anchoring us down. And what we did is we started from scratch and we took, I had six pages of notes for those two boxes and we made sure that the new mock-up addressed every single thing that people brought up you know, uh, every comment, every question, every concern. And so we, again, there's no drama because we hadn't done any coding. We did a whole new prototype. Uh, Marketingporeport.com was gone and we pivoted to junk mail freeze. So here's the new landing page, right, of junk mail freeze. <clears throat> and we learned a lot of things in the research and discovery. We learned, you know, over here we said reduce junk mail. I learned not all junk mail is the same. In that discovery section, I said, hey, tell me about your mail. And they would tell me about their mail and be like, well, you know, some people, We'd be like, yeah, those big thick catalogs, they're annoying because they clutter up my mailbox, they block it up, that's kind of annoying. Yeah, the Valpac coupons on the weekends, they're a little annoying, but they're not that as bad. But what's really annoying is those pre-approved credit cards and the cash advance checks, these financial related things. And I was like, oh, can you tell me why? And they said, well, I'm at work all day and you know, my, the mail comes and my mailbox sitting there, it's not locked or anything. Anybody could reach in there and take those things and like take money from my account or do identity theft, right? Um, so once we learned that, we put that front and center, like right here, all the stuff, right? So we could see the second time around, people like fixate in there and get angry thinking about someone stealing that stuff from them, right? Other things that we said, 
Um, I said, well, can you tell me in the discovery section, what do you do with junk mail? Multiple people said, well, Dan, what I do, I come home from work, I walk to my mailbox, I grab the stack of mail, and then I go back in my house, and I go straight to my shredder, and I go shred, 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 shred. Does anyone here do that? See, I didn't do that, so I didn't know. I'm like, wow, okay, how long do you spend shredding? They said five minutes a day. I'm like thinking in my head, the mail comes six days a week. That's 30 minutes a week. That's 1,500 minutes a year. There's a whole save time benefit. We didn't even have, we're missing a save time benefit box like right here. We missed that, right? So once we learned that, we put spend less time shredding mail, right? That was a learning that we had. Uh, other silly things, like we said save trees. For some reason, multiple people said, well, how many trees are you going to save? So the second time around, we put 43 trees in, and it was like, yeah, oh, okay, sounds good. That question went away, right? It's funny, that's what people cared about. And then there's a lot of stuff I'm not telling you is like the details of how you control which mail gets through and which mail gets blocked. It's like, I, you gotta block my catalog so they don't clutter up my mailbox, but my Pottery Barn catalog, the Pottery Barn's gotta get through. I got you. So like all those kind of nuances. And there were still some questions and comments, but there were a lot less. It was like night and day. And they didn't mention this, but both times we said, we asked people, hey, would you pay 10 bucks a month for this service or not? And it's always iffy to ask people that. If they don't actually have to bust out their wallet and pay you, that's the difference between attitudinal and behavior, especially when it comes to money, right? Um, but there was night and day difference. The first time around, no one was interested. No one was like, no, I'm, no, I wouldn't do that. Second time around, what they said, well, I need a 30-day trial. But if your product does what it says, I would gladly pay you 10 bucks a month. That was like a night and day difference from the first time around. <clears throat> And then the other thing that gave me confidence was after the test was done, it's like we're all done. It's like, Ian, thank you so much for your time. Here's your check for 75 bucks for doing this test with us, right? They were free to leave this awkward uh, usability test and go back to their lives. Almost every single person the second time after we gave them their the check was like, so, so is this product live now? Can I, can I go use this product? Like, no, no, we're still working on it. It's not quite ready. They're like, can you email me when, here's my email. Can you email me when it's ready? Like nobody had done that the first time. So for me, it was like another evidence point that we had improved the product market fit. So I was pretty excited about that. <laughs> so in, to summarize again, I know we're a little long here. Sorry about that guys, but uh, lean product process, start out by getting clear on your target customer. Use those segmentation attributes to get clear. Um, identify what their needs are, you know, explore the problem space, you know, define your problem space. Uh, figure out what your special sauce is, well, how you're going to be better or different. You know, figure out your MVP so you don't overscope before you confirm whether or not you're heading in the right direction. Um, you know, uh, figure out the UX design iceberg, you know, first with wireframes, then with your, your uh, higher fidelity clickable mockups, and iterate and test, test with your MVP of customers, and iterate through that hypothesized design test learn loop with the goal of achieving product market fit. Cool. Um, so it's been great talking with you. I'm going to take questions here. I just want to thank everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing is if you hold up your phone and you put on your camera to this QR code, can you guys just try that real quick and see if it works? That will go to a three question survey on your phone. I would love to get your feedback about what you liked about the talk and how I can make it better for next time. Um, I, I believe in that. It would be great to hear your feedback. Um, if for some reason you can't, the QR code should do it. If it doesn't, you can go there. And there's my contact information. With that, I'd love to open it up to questions with the audience. Again, I know we went late. If you've got to run, please, by all means, feel free to leave. If you want to stick around, I'm happy to ask questions. We've got some mics here. Um, so if you just want to make sure you have a mic so we can get it recorded, that would be great. Rohan, do you mind running that? Thanks, bud. Cool. Ian, you want to? Are you okay doing that? Thank, or, sure, sure. Or we can find something else. Cool, thanks. All right. Anybody got a question I can answer? Hi. Hi. It should be on if you turn it up. Okay. Oh, right, good. There you go. And I have two questions. Uh, first one it's is... It's going to cost you double. Uh, okay. I'm joking. <laughs> joke. Yes. Um, so to get... Uh, you're testing your subjects for, for startups. Do yeah. you use a professional recruiter or... N no, I don't think you need to. So what I, what I said for this one, it was a while ago, and there were some online, it's called a panel, like what they do, all these outfits, what they do is they find people that have raised their hand and said, I'm willing to do research and I'm willing to do a survey to go, right? So before the internet existed, those panels existed in the real world. There would be research companies that would find people in the Bay Area that would raise their hand and say, I'm up for it. And they would do quotas, so like you wouldn't be in there every week or every month. It'd be like, they'd, they'd space people out to make sure, you know, and then you talk to them about what are the criteria you're looking for and they would deal the screening and all that. So that's the analog, the, the brick and mortar analog. 
Nowadays, there are website equivalents of that, usertesting.com, Validately, which just got acquired by UserZoom, userinterviews.com, I like them. If all you want is the users and you don't care about the platform or the video, if you're gonna use Zoom on your own, userinterviews.com is probably the most cost-effective way of those. Um, now, if you're doing things at scale, usertesting.com is like an enterprise-level solution that's great at scale and they have a lot of full, full-featured offering too. But the long story short is, no, that you can basically all these tools have self-service screeners. It's basically like SurveyMonkey in their web tool. You say, okay, I want females between 30 and 40, and they need to like say that they value privacy and this, and then it'll, they'll, they'll send that to their millions of users, and then you'll get back some. And then it's kind of cool. Like The way it usually works is you'll see the people that match, and then you can go through and look and see and decide which ones you want to say, okay, I want to schedule these three now. And then they often have a calendar UI where you can say, okay, here's when I have slots. And then they'll offer that to the people. That's all automated, basically. So you don't need like a person going out there and finding these people for you in general. Now, I guess if you had a very, very specialized need, like, hey, I need like, you know, doctors that work on the specific type of cancer or something, then maybe they're not going to be in that broad panel. And you need to, in those kind of situations, you might need more targeted recruiting. But for most B2B, a B2C for sure, SMB, even B2B, like they, a lot of these, they, they, they bring in job titles and things like that. So you can even say, I'm targeting you know, directors of marketing or something. You can kind of find that too. So, second question? I tried to remember it. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. We can Maybe go back. I'll oh. pass. If okay, that's back. cool. The mics will be here. He's got one right here. We got another one here. Hey, uh, this is really good talk. This is Anand from Facebook product. Uh, quick question, definitely on the on the persona side with B two B. How do you how do you do that? Like because there are multiple people. Mm -hmm. One is the the VP of product, <laughs> VP of let's say marketing, who is mm -hmm. actually paying the money for let's yep. say marketing automation product, and the yep. actual user the user who is like <clears throat> a different employee. That's right. So how do you manage different sets of yeah. uh, personas and then balance their it's a great question and it's not just B2B. So Uber needs drivers and riders. Airbnb needs guests and hosts. So it's pretty common that you have more than one persona whose needs you need to address. I'm glad you brought that up because basically each of those, what's the foundation of the pyramid? It's a target customer. So anytime you have a different target customer, you actually have a whole different pyramid. And so um, in the B2B case, you could have an economic buyer versus an end user. There's often also an admin use case. If you think about salesforce.com, there's the end users, there's the head of sales who's probably buying it, and then there's like an admin who's configuring it for everybody. So that's just one example. Um, another mistake I see people make is they have too many personas. Like I go in there, yeah, we have personas down there, like 10 personas. I'm like, okay, you gotta prioritize or else people don't know what's going on. So um, yeah, I mean, I think having you know two or three is good. Um, one of the four books that I reference in my book is um, Alan Cooper's The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. So he was a guy who really pushed personas. His book, it's an older book, but he talks, he kind of is the authority on personas. And he has specific guidance on when you have multiple personas, how do you handle that, how do you pick a primary, and things like that. So I would recommend checking out his book. But yes, you definitely, it's not just one persona. You also don't want to have too many. You want to do the right number that are true personas, and then you have to deal with prioritizing them. Yeah. Hi, Dan. It's uh, Yuvak uh, At the Going back to the pyramid, uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have uh, the target customers. Mm -hmm. On top, we have uh, underserved needs, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to start something new, mm -hmm. something from... Wouldn't the underserved need, need come at the bottom and then target customer on top of it? Like, how does that work? You know, I get that question every once in a while. And that's where, that's the whole reason, like, I, we talked about, I hear you, I, and I, but that's why, I, like, if you remember this slide, you, you cannot get past the surface of the onion if, that's, if you just look at that way, right? So I think you can start your discovery with that, but then the next question I would say is who has this need? You can't, it's not needs don't exist in a vacuum, you know what I mean? So it's perfectly f fine to start your brainstorming. I, it's kind of funny, it's like how would you come up with that? A lot of times you come up with it by observing people or you're the target market. But if, even if you jumped in at the need level, that's fine. But the next thing I would say is who had, what's my hypothesis about who has these needs? You know what I mean? Because that's how you peel the onion and get more detailed. So it's okay to start with that, but I wouldn't stop there. Right. Yeah, because then you also got to figure out who to talk to to do discovery on this. So you need to you need the screener criteria to know who to talk to. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who's got the mic? 
Gotta have a mic. So we catch it. All right. Rohan can give you a mic. Oh. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, here. Oh. Hi. Uh, Hi. Great talk. So Thanks. I work on industrial augmented reality, and so this is kind of like a new technology. So when we picked our main use case, we gave it to the to the user, and they start coming up with hundreds of ideas. Uh -huh. And so the challenge we're, we're facing is like, how do you choose between a feature and a product? Some of the ideas are very valuable in terms of pursuing it as a, a, its own product, and but they might be unrelated to the core product. So kind of making that decision, the trade-off between mm -hmm. that, how mm -hmm. would you approach that problem? Well, what the way I think about that is the reality is, you know, sometimes you have a simple situation where one product meets one primary need. That's a pretty simple situation. The reality is most product, even with TurboTax, right? Some save time, save money, make me feel empowered. There's three benefits right there at the at the high level, there's three benefits. So you can think about products as addressing like a basket of needs. So if, to me, that comes down to what's the right way to slice and dice the baskets of needs to products, right? Think about um, you know, Microsoft Office. You've got Word, Excel, PowerPoint. They didn't say, let's do one program that does it all, right? They actually have three, and then they have a suite that does them all together, right? So that's, that's how I think about it. Like, how, that's where you get into your product portfolio, and what's the right way to, to do that. So um, yeah, I mean, I think when you have so many opportunities, I'd want to run some kind of value filter through it and figure out what's the highest value. out. That's where the importance and satisfaction thing I didn't have time to share today. I would run those things through there and find the ones that are the most underserved and start with those and try to create a basket of those um, and have that be my first product. And then maybe down the way you, you launch a, you know, additional products or ancillary products to address the secondary kind of needs. That's what I would say. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hi, Dan. Uh, thank you for the great talk, by the way. Um, my question is about how do, man how do you manage the expectations from people that, taste, that are doing the testing upstream in first wave, second wave, when you have five, six, seven waves, and you have to go to productizations, you have to go to mm -hmm. the alpha, beta, etc. Mm -hmm. How do you manage the expectation from the people are doing the, the first round of testing? When you say that, are you talking about a B2B? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. And the people, just to be clear, it's the customers? Exactly. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so the, just to recast the question, I, I think I would understand, it's like, hey, we're going to need multiple waves. So we show the first V1 MVP to this, you know, eight or ten customers, and then we don't talk to them because we're going off. Dan says to rinse and repeat. So it may be a long time before we get back to them, like, hey, what's up with the product? So, yeah, I mean, um, I think it's very clean if you use new people, but you can use existing people. So it's a very, a very common B2B hack is to say, okay. We're going to do this new feature. It's a big functionality. Um, maybe it makes sense to get one or two beta clients who are willing to jump in with us in private beta. So then it's not just like a one and done test. It's like, no, they're in the foxhole with us as we iterate. So that's OK, too. That, that's very common. Um, the key thing is selecting the right person, though, because if they're idiosyncratic, if their needs and preferences don't represent the other people in that vertical, then you're listening very closely to this one person. They're taking you in this direction, but it's not the right thing. So, so it can be helpful to you know talk to you know a second and a third at the right time before you go too far, just to kind of pattern match and make sure. Does that make sense? So I think in B2B context, in a kind of an early access private beta, it's fine to to go back to them. Or even like maybe you skip around. Maybe you say, okay, we're going to show you know you know we're going to show V1 to this these customers and then V2 to this new set of customers, and then maybe with V3 we'll go back to the, you know, you, you could alternate. You could say that way they're not seeing every little change, but they're seeing every other change. That's okay, yeah. You know, there's a question of should you go back. For B to C, there's no real reason to go back, you know. And that's what's, on the one hand, it might be, again, you might be alluring to be like, well, I want to show them the new one so they can say, look how much better it is than the old one, right? But it's hard for someone to unlearn, once they've seen something, unlearn it. So they're not truly a new user anymore, right? And back to my prototypical test, you know, that's not what a cold body new user would see. So, you know, in certain cases, I actually, like when you use these platforms, a lot of times after the interview, you have to confirm that they did the interview so they get paid. And I'll say like, hey, do you want to flag them to maybe talk to them later? I wouldn't be opposed if there was a particularly savvy user that seemed like a really good product market fit. 
I wouldn't be opposed to keeping them on that list and maybe, you know, four or five iterations, you know, three to five iterations down, circling back and saying, hey, can I just see what you think about this? But I would be very careful and knowing that they were someone that I already saw in a B2C context, you know, but in B2B, it's more common to go back to the same people more frequently. So, yeah. Yeah, but you got to make sure they're not, that you're getting a representative sample, right? <coughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, of course it takes a long time. And, I, you know, I think that part of it, you know, is um, it's, a, it's a balancing act of you can, you know, the care you have to offer them, right? Because, you know, a lot of times is like, well, you're going to have to spend time and money. So it's like, it reminds me of Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm, who spoke at our meetup, the videos online, but it's like, who are the early adopters? Who, who are the really innovative people who feel that pain point so bad they're willing to jump in the foxhole with you Use the buggy alpha, take the time to give you the fear. So there's that kind of psychographic segmentation that you need. Um, uh, and, and, and then, you know, but then you want to make sure they're not idiosyncratic. And so, you, you know, so you could even come up with, okay, we're going to spend the first four weeks with them. And then after four weeks, we're going to bring in beta client two in addition, you know, or you can say, you know, maybe we're going to work with these clients and we're going to like, you know, every other version will go back to each one. So they're each getting hit you know, more frequently than they would have. But anyway, you know, there's, there's a few strategies you can do there. But the key at the end of the day is what's the whole population of who we're going to hit? Is it three, two, three, four, five clients? How confident we are, are we that they are representative of the whole vertical? Those are the key questions that come up. And then how you divide it up and how frequently you want to touch them is just up to design the program. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes, Julie. Oh. Yeah, thanks for a very insightful session. Really enjoyed it. So uh, my question is, what have you seen teams do go wrong with this process? What are the biggest mistakes that uh, you have seen them make? Uh, I mean, to recap some of the ones I mentioned, they make their MVP too big. They don't say no. And part of it is just being able to say no. Like, no, let's test it, right? So MVP too big. Um, you know, I... The reason I showed the, the iceberg of design is you need someone to create these prototypes. You need someone who's good enough at interaction design and visual design. So, you know, not every team has someone who's good at that, right? Um, so that's one thing. And that's where, you know, um, like a lot of times I will do the wireframes and then I'll find a visual designer. So like, well, Jan right here helped me out one time, right? So you, sometimes you need to bring in other resources to help you out with plug the holes that you need, right? Maybe... For whatever reason, no one on your team is good at user testing or something. I don't know. I just got done telling you it's the easiest thing to learn. So that's not the case. But theoretically, you could say, oh, let's go hire a user researcher, right? So you might need to augment certain skills. Um, but um, as long as you have someone who can create those prototypes for you, you should be OK. Um, I mentioned the user, in the user interviews, traps to avoid, right? Don't use leading questions. Don't use closed questions. Um, the other thing I see, sometimes I see people, they listen to all this, like, Dan, I get it, I'm going to do it. I went and I did the user tests, and when I tried to make sense of the 10 users, it was like a shotgun scatter plot. Like, there was no pattern at all. And so what that, usually that's an indication to me that they didn't peel the onion enough on their target customer, right? That they're talking, you're getting noisy data because you got noisy customer definition, right? You're, yeah, I'm talking SMBs. Well, there's like actually the 10 people were like five different types of SMBs and you didn't peel the onion enough, right? So that's the idea. Like, it, like me, it, the minor example, when I was doing my news app, unbeknownst to me, I was getting three different types of preferred news model people. I didn't even know, I was naive to that fact. And then when 15% when of people started saying, I would never use your product, it made me aware that, wow, there's some attribute I'm missing. How do you like to get your news, right? So same kind of thing. That's the thing is, is if you're getting noisy data, it means you're probably not clear enough on your target customer definition. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. I finally All remembered. right. Um, when you're doing a usability test, yes. if somebody is working with the prototype on their phone and you're on uh -huh. a Zoom conversation, how could you see what they're doing? Zoom is on the phone. They have Zoom on the phone now. Okay. Yeah. So you're talking about the, so the funny thing is the, the difference is do you see their face or do you see the screen? But Zoom has screen sharing. So, so on a computer you can see both, but Zoom has screen sharing on the app. So you just say, okay, cool, and you can do it exactly. But that's the kind of logistics you have to plan ahead. 
like you have to kind of let people know ahead of time this is going to be on an iPhone or this is going to be on this so they can do it. But yeah, no, totally. It has a Zoom. It has an app. Yeah. The tough part is you can't see their face while they're, you know, while they're doing it. Or what will happen a lot of times is you'll be on a, on a webcam call and they'll be like, yeah, let me show you on my phone. Yeah, and you can't see it because it's so small, right? So, so if, you, if you plan to do the phone screen sharing, it's a good point. If you're planning to test a phone-based thing, which if it's a phone-based thing, you should do it on the phone. My principle is make it be as prototypical as possible. Along those lines, I don't like, even like when we're doing a test, I don't, I make sure they're using their device, whether it's a laptop or a phone. I want it to be their device. Like actually literally two nights ago, I found an Android phone on the, my wife and I were walking, I found an Android phone on the road. I'm like Android dumb, man. I'm an iPhone person. I'm like trying to figure out how to navigate around and stuff. I'm not that good at it. Like those kind of differences in controls or between Firefox and Chrome or between Windows and Mac will get in the way. So it's best to use their device. But back to your point, if it's going to be on a phone, plan the whole test out and you know you're going to use Zoom on a phone and then you're not going to be able to see their face and probably at the same time. But they will have the screen sharing on the phone. You can do that. And by the way, I mentioned InVision and InVision has grown into the mobile space. There are some mobile specific prototyping apps that I mentioned in the book. Uh, like Marvel, Flinto, things like that. There, and I'm sure there's even more. There's better ones now. Figma's another tool that people are using. There's a lot of the tools constantly, you know, are constantly new, new tools coming out to make it easier to prototype and test things. So you can use your, your Marvel prototype with Zoom also? Mm -hmm. Or an InVision mobile prototype with Zoom. That's right. That's okay. exactly right. Or the next step, just since we're talking about mobile, is test flight, right? So if you get to the next point of I've got a working app, Apple acquired this startup called TestFlight that makes easy distribution of, like it's not on the App Store yet, but you're sending it out to people to test. That's like a real app then, but yeah. Hi. Hi. Great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. So my question is, how much do you rely on uh, these usability testing and how do you cater your decisions based on the, these kind of testings? How much do you think I rely on them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot. Okay. A lot. Like, what else is more important than that? Data. Let me, I'm not to be too extreme, but what's more, what's going to trump? What, here, let me go back to this. I'll go back to this. Right? If this is what I learn in my user test wave, what am I going to doubt? What am I you going to use to doubt this or shoot this down with? There's, I mean, there's no, like someone in the building, what, the only way this goes south is someone in the building goes, oh, you guys don't know how to run a test. This is all baloney data. That's the only way to invalidate. I mean, you know, you can't argue with the fact that we talked, and this is five, let's just double it. We talked to 10 users and eight of them couldn't, eight of them said this. Like, who can argue against that, right? So the challenge is when it's not so clear. When it's black and white, it's easy, right? The, the, Question is when it's gray or shades of gray and you think there might be a problem or this or that. That's where there's debate and discussion. But, um, but when there's hard data, the whole point is let's get the irrefutable data. You know, that's the whole point. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's pretty, if you do it right, there should be a lot of conviction around it and a lot of belief in it, you know. Um, and then, you know, some places, sometimes I get the question of, hey, what if we do this, but then it doesn't agree with the key stakeholder's point of view and we go and show it to them and they don't agree and they still stick to their point of view. And usually the way that works is they will say, well, um, I don't know this prototype, I don't know who did the test, I don't know what's up, they probably weren't that good. Maybe you talk, oh, this is a great one, you talk to the wrong people, we need to talk to more people. You talk to right. And um, so to, de to mitigate that, if I know that's the situation, I will include them in every step of the lean product process. I'd be like, hey, oh, we have our personas. Do you, do you agree with these personas or not? I'll make sure that they agree and if they have any concerns. And then I'll say, oh, here's our value prop. Do you agree with the value prop? Yeah, cool. Here's our MVP proposal for functionality. Do you agree with that? Yeah, okay. Here's our uh, UX design. Do you agree with that? Yeah, okay, cool. Now what? They got no wiggle room. Like the only thing they have now is, well, you must have ran the user test poorly or so. Like, you know, and at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't want to really know the truth and reality and be evidence based, it doesn't matter. You're never going to be able to please them. And there are just some people who are much more intuition based. And it's like, hey, I'm the senior person. My skin's on the line. I'm the one who's getting hired or fired. So um, we're going to do it this way kind of thing. So that's just, it's just a different environment than someone who's, you know, it's a little bit not to make the analogy too much. It's like, it's like scientific method. What's our hypotheses? How do we test them? What's the cheapest, fastest way to test them? What are we learning? How are we improving our mental model? 
you know, that's what it's really about. So, Thank you. yeah, I'm going to pass the mic to your neighbor. Yeah, yeah okay, we'll, we'll go back. Yeah. Hi, thank you so right. much. It was very insightful talk. My question is, um, you know, uh, like, uh, uh, go back and think again about the point like you know before doing any kind of MVP or anything you have an idea and you want to really test it first with the users using the surveys that your idea will be really working or not so how would you avoid like okay being bias into surveys like how would I test so let's just take let's go here let's do the little example here let's go to here so we've got let's do this right we've got Let's say we're crystal clear, like let's just say that MVP. That's our value prop and the MVP, that's our concept. How would I validate this with a survey? So we want to test that set of functionality and see if people are going to like it or not. How would I test it with a survey? My question was, like how would you avoid being like unbiased in survey? How would you get a Right, but did I say survey at all for any of the method, any of what I was talking about? I was talking about one-on-one -on -one interviews. Yeah, you yeah. So I don't like to use surveys for this stuff. Okay. Surveys, in my mind, are the wrong tool for this stuff. Okay, that's what I'm. Yeah. Saying. Yeah. yeah. So it's not surveys. Um, it's 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 one on one user interviews, mm -hmm. and then you pattern match like I was showing, mm -hmm. because what I do see, I, the reason I said that is you will see people trying to prove that this is right with the survey. And this is what I also love to say is like you know okay. Um, who would like an app that makes it, um, let's see, let me, let me think of something good. Who would like an app that makes it really easy to find a parking space nearby? Who would like that? Here, yeah, great. I guarantee, so what I just said is a problem space statement, right? I guarantee the app that he envisioned in his head is not the same app that you envisioned in your head or the one that you thought. When I say that, each of you is kind of envisioning your ideal parking space finder app. I guarantee the MVP I come up with is not going to live up to the expectations that you just had. So that's the thing is, when you do a survey, it's text-based. I'm asking you a question. How much, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much would you like a parking space finder app? It's so simplistic, right? It's like, let's just take a photo sharing app. How many photo sharing? You, it's, it's, a, it's too blunt of an instrument, right? In fact, I'll, I'll give you a, a survey fail that happened to me recently. Um, I was using an app and that I use a fair bit and when I logged in it had a pop-up and it said hey we'd like to do some user research with you and I'm like cool I love user research let's do it and so I hit OK and then the first question on the survey came up and it said please rank or here are five reasons people use our app please rank or these based on your order of importance sounds good right guess what my top reason wasn't on the list of five. Mm -hmm. Fail. Like that's a survey fail. Like those happen all the time. You don't, you write the question poorly. You want to get a feature approved by the stakeholders? I can write a survey that will get that thing approved by the stakeholders by, by doing a certain way. You want to get it killed? I can get its kneecap cut off. We'll get that feature. It's not going to happen. I'm going to write the survey. Oh, everyone in the survey didn't want this feature. There's so many, and that's if you want to deliberately do it. Right? But I'm just saying not deliberate manipulation, but just like not like sloppy survey design. One is using the tool for the wrong thing. Second is sloppy design. I was very fortunate when I worked here at Intuit. I had a PhD in market research in our team. So she taught me like how to do qualitative, how to do surveys and things like that. So um, people misuse it. It can be used for certain things, but not for this early validation stuff. You got to show someone a, a prototype that's high enough fidelity, high enough interactivity, so they can engage. Oh, this parking space app, this is a piece of junk. I would never use this. But if I just say in the abstract, would you like a parking space app? You're going to say yeah. So anyway, long answer to your question, but um, that's why the, uh, what's the most popular survey that's used in the business world? Not the tool, but the, like the type of survey. NPS, like everybody knows NPS. Why is it so popular and why does it not fall into some of the traps I've said? How many questions is an NPS survey? It's one. <laughs> How much leeway do you have in asking the question? You get to do an ad lib and just put in the name of your product. I literally just did this on SurveyMonkey for this. That's all. How likely would you be to recommend Product X to a friend or colleague? All you get to do is replace Product X. So they've put major guardrails. It's one question. They've put major guardrails. You have to fit on the template. 
And then on the answers, can you change the answer possibilities? No, it's zero to 10. So they put all these guardrails around it. And at the end of the day, say you get an NPS of 25, is that good or bad? You don't know. You just need to compare it over time, right? So anyway, NPS I think is one of the more popular ones just because it's, they put all these safety mechanisms around it to prevent you from writing freeform bad survey questions and things like that. Anyway, long story on that. But, and surveys do have use for certain things, but not as much for this early product validation stuff, I would say. Yes. Hey Dan, uh, thanks for the great talk. Yeah. This is Kamal doing product at PayPal. Uh, I had a question around, uh, let's say, adding new features instead of creating a new product altogether. So you're, mm -hmm. you have an existing product yep. and you are creating new features. Right. And trying to identify from the user, um, you're trying to um, find their needs and test the solutions. Now at that point, some of these users might have preconceived notions about how the product works and what kind of features already exist. How do you kind of get get unbiased feedback from them? Because why would that Why would that create bias? That's what I'm, I understand. If they're using PayPal today and you're adding a new feature, of course they're anchored on what PayPal. But why would it be bias? In the sense that uh, they're just anchored to what the, how the feature currently works and that they're already used to it. So how do you? And what, you're testing a new version of it or a new feature? Okay. Well, what you could do is test with new users instead. They won't have that, right? Right, you just. Yeah, that, that's something we've tried. I think we've tried both, like uh, mm -hmm. test with new users or test with, like, sometimes you want people who use the product, mm -hmm. but add like, uh, so we, who are familiar with the concept and uh, use the product, sure. but then want an improved version of that. Sure. I mean, I think that's the reality. I mean, uh, the, the, the curse of a successful product like PayPal or Quicken or Adobe or whatever it is, is you've got millions of users. So they are anchored on what you've got. So if you change the UI, you know, there, some are going to complain, right? I, was just, I don't think it's a bias. I think it's reality. I think it's human nature. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the number of times people do UI design redesigns of a product and throw the baby out with the bathwater happens all the time. Right, it happens all the time. I mean, like, look, what was it? Um, Snapchat, didn't they do that? Didn't they, like, they did a whole UI redesign and their active users dropped quite a bit, right? So it's tough, it, it's tough. Um, so I don't know that, I think, I think I would basically say I need to solve for that. So I need to, my new version of the feature, or my new feature needs to do a good enough job compared to the status quo that people see a reason that they would, you know what I mean, be excited about that than not. So I don't know. That's what I would say. You know, it's funny, my, my wife's a doctor and there's a principle which comes up for me because, you know, each time we would do a quick and upgrade, sometimes uh, something would get broken or a feature would get taken away. And I, I, when I, it didn't happen that often. When I caught wind of it, I would try to recuperate. The medical saying is like, first do no harm. <laughs> first do no harm, right? So a lot of times we do, you know, redesigns or we do, you know, refactorings or we do a V2 and we're, no one's trying to deliberately do harm, but we unintentionally do harm. So it's, it's important to like instrument things with metrics to make sure that you have a before and after. But at the end of the day, yeah, it's, I, we can talk more about the specifics of your situation one-on-one -on -one if you want. But, you know, if you've got millions of existing users and you launch a new feature or a new UI, it's not a bias. It's their reality in my mind. You know what I mean? Now, if you, you can test it, that's funny because if you think about Microsoft Word, same thing, right? Um, there are very few products that are, have been around for so long that there's like accumulated functionality and fun like over time, the number of lines of code, right? That is quick in Adobe Photoshop, like, you know, TurboTax, Microsoft Office products. After a while, a certain number of customers, the number one thing they want is less features. Give me less features, right? So I don't know, it's a long time ago now, but what happens is your power users, they know all the keyboard shortcuts, they know how to do it but the new users get lost, right? And so you've got this balance between your power users and your new users. I don't know if you remember, but when Microsoft Word, all the products, they introduced the ribbon thing. You know, it was like, the, it was to make new user experience a lot better. They didn't kill the power user shortcuts when they did it. So yes, yeah, some of the power users complain, what's this wonky ribbon thing there? But that's how they kind of like, so I think of it like surgery. How do you surgically insert the stuff that's going to make things easier for the new users without pissing off the power users? That's the trick. How do you recommend, like, would you recommend uh, testing with both kinds of users? Yeah, and definitely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 
Hey Dan, uh, thanks a lot. This was a great talk. Really appreciate it. I have a couple of questions. So first, when we have limited budget and we cannot really interview a whole universe of people, but we need five. to scale. Five. Um, You're really small budget. Five people. But what? let's say if it's a B2C product and we have thousands of users and five is not statistically significant. Is 10? Maybe 100. Okay. And so after a certain point of time, those interviews would go in the same direction. We need to ask same set of questions and maybe the first few interviews will tell us what questions we should ask and we should have the right options to maybe do a survey at scale. Does that actually work or it has to be 100 no. interviews? It doesn't have to be 100. That's what I'm saying is you're holding on to like chi squared expectations in a situation that doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to do that. The, I gave a talk like this once and somebody said at the end of the talk, well, how many users are you talking to? And I said, 10. And she looked me straight in the eyes and she said, that's not statistically significant. And I said, you're right. How many should I interview? And she said, a thousand. You said a hundred, you're not as crazy. But she said a thousand. So then get this though, she said a thousand. And then I said, are you sure that's enough? She said, you're right, 10,000. <laughs> and then I said, okay, how long would it take to do 10,000 one-on-one interviews? It just doesn't make sense. It's a, it, an A-B testing mindset makes no sense with what we're talking about here. And I actually have a slide. Uh, I, didn't, I almost put it in, but I ran out of time. So let me close with this slide because I know it's getting late and I'm happy to answer questions one-on-one. What did I talk about here? I mean, I mentioned when I talked about the different MVPs, I talked about A-B testing and stuff like that, but not when I was talking about testing these concepts. I mainly was talking about qualitative techniques. Qualitative means um, it's not statistically significant. I want to have in-depth, one-on-one conversations and really get into the, the meat and the juice and the problem space and peel the onion. That's what it's all about. I like to give each of these approaches a personification, a person real or fake, that represents them. So when I think about who is the best person at sitting down with someone one-on-one -on -one and getting them to open up and make them tick and maybe even make them cry on TV, who's good at that? Oprah, that's right. See, Oprah. So what I taught you today is the Oprah technique, okay? And it's fundamentally different than the quantitative technique, right? The quantitative technique, so when qualitative, each user you're talking to is a snowflake. You actually care what they say. Of course we want a pattern match like I showed you, but you actually care what each person has to say. In quantitative, you don't care. Each person's a data point. I want a bunch of them. I want 10,000 so I can figure out the average and the distribution and all that jazz. So again, to personify these, who's the, from, 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 uh, from, from sci-fi, who's the master of logic and analysis? Spock. So you're giving me a very Spock kind of philosophy and I'm just saying I don't think it's the right situation. Um, especially when you have a brand new product, you're a brand new startup, how many customers do you have? Zero. You don't have 10,000 to go find, or 10,000 or 100 to find. So you got to get comfortable. So what, what somebody once said, this is what I said, this is why I said what I said, which is if you, if, if you run your prototype and 8 out of 10 people tell you that they cannot figure out how to register, do you go all Spock and say, I need to talk to 10,000 people to see if this is a real pattern? <laughs> do you really need to do that if 80% of people can't figure it out? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. So somebody made a good point. Maybe this helps. It's like, ba it's more Bayesian than statistical. It's, that's, that's kind of what they said, kind of thing. So that's, you know what I mean? So don't get me wrong. I appreciate both. I'm a double E, I'm a math geek. I love that stuff. I reserve it though for after we launch, and we've, got, and we've got enough user volume, then by all means I'll use it. I'll use a sharper instrument whenever I can. But it's actually the wrong instrument right now. The way that would play out here is, let's launch both products and see which one does better, right? Or let's launch both UXs. That makes no sense, because now you're spending twice the effort to build it, you know what I mean? So anyway, I'm happy to talk more. I don't even mean to make light of it, but that's why I said, hey, if five feels, just go to 10. But the, the, if you do the calculation, the difference between 10 and 15, it, it's not going to change. Like you need to get such a high number, it's not practical. So you're just looking for, I guess if it makes more sense, you're looking for directional feedback, right? And you want to see directionally that the major objections diminish and go to zero, and that the compliments and the positive praise start coming up. That's what I would say. So, yeah. One last question. Sure.
Okay. Last question, and then we'll give the books away. Speaking of the book. Yeah, so okay. uh, when you talk about this idea of satisfaction versus needs. Yeah. And then you ask them question from a scale of one to ten. What's yep. your satisfaction? That's right. Was that a good? Is that good on survey or is that good on? That's good on survey. You know, that's it's it. You can do it on a survey, and so that's some of the things that you. In fact, the the way I developed that was here at Intuit with that PhD market researcher. We had I had like all this survey data, and I was like doing X by Y of all these different things in a Spock manner to find out what made sense. And so yes, if you you know, it's kind of like MPS like. So if you, if you use it in the right place, you can, but you've got to be really clear on, you know, one, very thoughtful in the scales that we're using, like there's a reason it's a five point scale for the importance and a seven point scale, bimodal scale for the satisfaction. Um, and uh, the presumption is that somebody knows what you're asking about. So if I say, how satisfied are you with X? So in, the, in that particular instance, it was because it was, a, it was a feature in our product and we specifically before we said, have you used this feature in the last three months? So then if we say, have you used the budgeting feature in the last three months? Okay, how important is the budgeting feature to you? They don't, I'm not worried that they don't know what I'm talking about. It's very specific. But if instead I said, how important is it to you to share photos with your friends? Like now we're getting very vague and fuzzy a little bit, right? And adding so, a visual there would be helpful. It might be helpful but you're really stretching it. If it's a visual of something they've already used to remind them, maybe, but if it's a visual of a new thing they've never seen before, you know what I mean? Like, you know, so, and I've, you've done that. You know, you can do that. You can try to like, I've seen that. You know where it works is like taglines, like a tagline. Sure, survey a tagline. You know, what do you, and, but, but the key is, the reality is they're both valuable. It's not an either or, right? So this is the next slide I always show right after the, uh, right after the Oprah one, is that quantitative tell you what are people doing and how many are doing it. But you have no reason why. Okay, great, the conversion rate on this page is 26%. You have no reason why the 26% clicked or why the 74% didn't click. Qualitative will tell you why. Hey, here's the five reasons people do this or the three ways that people like to get their news, but I don't know what the incidence in the population truly is of those different things, right? But so they're, they're both valuable. Sometimes you start in qual and it makes you wonder about the sizes and you go to quant. Sometimes you start in quant and go, huh, we've got a really low conversion rate. I wonder why, and you go to qual. So they both complement each other. All right, cool. With that, I'm going to close it. Let's give out some books here.